Yo, yo. What up? What up? Yo. What up? What up? Hey. Hey, welcome. Welcome to Benny's crib. What up? Oh, uh, yeah, just leave your shoes over there. It's cool. Yeah, thanks. Does that sound cool? Yo. Yo, what up? Welcome to Benny's crib. Tremendous. We are recording. We are here, and uh, I'm mad excited, y'all. If you know me, this is Benny's Crib. I'm Benny P, editor in chief of Rhyme Beats. I'm a big hip hop fan, especially main hip hop. And uh, I'm going to gas you up, so I don't want to embarrass you here, but we got, a, in my opinion, the 207, a main hip hop, a hip hop legend on the podcast today, as well as many other hats that he wears. We got Soul here on the podcast. How we doing, Soul? Uh, I'm doing excellent. You know, I'm ready for this fucking winter, ready for this pandemic winter to end. That's Same. for damn sure. I'm ready to get out. You know, we live in the, we're both living in Maine right now. The last week has been really cold. Yeah, freezing. I need some vitamin D. I need some longer days. I need some bonfires, man. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Well, um, for those, and, who- yeah. Thanks, thanks for calling me a legend. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> no 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 worries man well we're here to celebrate two things in my opinion specifically um yeah we should give people their flowers and definitely always um go through the history of what they've done we'll do that today but right now i'm pumped because you have two exciting um endeavors that are out we have the new album um mbfx that just dropped and then you also have pivoted and started a new podcast correct um yeah 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 kind of yeah, it's the soul cast. It's a rebrand. It's, I've rebranded. It's, it's still you had the, what your debut episode a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sweet. So congrats on yep. both of those. Thanks. And we in the other thing I'm psyched about is that we broke off uh, our plant stuff from the soul cast um, propaganda by the seed, and so now that's like its own another its own podcast, just kind of about you know permaculture and food forestry stuff and uh just nerding out on plants and like that that project's really fun too and it's especially fun because it just like is a collaboration that happened just randomly when i moved here when i met the guy who runs this nursery in falmouth called edgewood nursery and he just yep. happened to, he happened to be an anarchist and so <laughs> i was like all right let's fucking let's do this shit because a lot of the I know a lot of the permaculture stuff is kind of yuppie-ish. And so it's like, I, you know, I think like, you know, plants, give plants their edge. Give them, yeah, give no, that's their, cool. Give them their due. There's probably not a lot of plant anarchists in Falmouth, Maine either. So that's pretty, uh, that's a pretty one of one to find, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think there are, I mean, there, there's a, there's not, there's not a lot of anarchist activity in Portland, um, unfortunately, but there's a lot of like, anarchist farmers and radical farmers all over maine that are yeah. like mating which is like pretty cool that's an interesting subculture of mainers to get into of you wouldn't really like think of that as like a dominant hegemony out here but i bet it's pretty popping due to how much farmland there is out here well yeah i think a lot of like earth firsters and stuff retired and just like bought farms and i mean it's kind of a, I th- i'm starting to learn it's like a trajectory of like people doing shit in their lives and then they're like all right time to do the farm thing now yeah yeah that's cool gotta go somewhere definitely we'll we'll get into that i'm I'm big on farming i'm big on sustainability and like independence myself i'm trying to get to those levels i see you doing amazing shit out there at least to me it is but we'll get to that in a little bit um because i kind of wanted to start with the beginning of soul's journey if you're down i got a an important question that i ask everybody this is how i start off my interviews with most artists what's your first memory of hip-hop it's the same as Anthony maintains, to be honest. Um, fucking fat boys. No I was shit. watching some Hollywood movie and some fat boys song like came on in the background and just like the way that they were stringing words together over beats. Like I'd never heard anything like it. And um, <clears throat> it just like resonated with me at a very young age. And then I, I don't know, I got into like, I think like the rap and duke compilation fat boys run dmc beastie boys and 
I feel like those were my big four starting out. Yeah. But classic golden age stuff. Yeah. I mean, the truth is there just wasn't that much shit. You know, it wasn't like there were 5,000 SoundCloud rappers uploading <laughs> the album every week. And like, yeah. you know, there's a pretty high barrier to entry back then. Definitely. Definitely. Well, first off, rest in peace to uh, Prince Marky D of the Fat Boys because he passed away um, last month. So oh, shout shit. Out him. Yeah. So shout out that real quick. Um, shout out the legend. And yeah, Fat Boys, man, those, they're huge. I always talk about how like, they just seem like such a, because I was more of a 90s hip hop kid and 2000s hip hop kid growing up. But in my research, the fat boys just look so much fun. Like, how could you not want to be a part of that, you know, in a sense? How could you not want to listen to them and pig out with them? So that's cool. Well, I mean, you know, the other thing is like, you know, like body positivity and shit. Like, you know, um, I mean, I, I don't think you could have had the fat girls back then. You know what I mean? But yeah. um, at least like. You know, I don't know. I think there's like something to that too. They just didn't didn't give a fuck. Most definitely they're not LL Cool J ripped working out during like, you know, a radio press run or something like that. You know, they're eating cheeseburgers. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's funny, man. All right. Well, um, you were born in Portland, correct? Yes. Yeah. Where'd you grow up in Maine? Did you grow up in Portland or somewhere else? I grew up in um the Deering area. I kind of grew up on Reed Street and Woodlawn Avenue behind what used to be the walk-in and uh Whoa. by Chevers high school is where yeah I, the right? walk-in like that's that's my hood that's yeah my stop it that in that little area love it love it um what were your hobbies growing up maybe you know in your teenage years when you started to be more independent did you have anything you spent your time doing pretty much uh, graffiti nice. um graffiti video games and rap that was it and trying to be hard mm, mm. what did yeah, that we mean like we were like you know we had little gangs and shit you know we tried to be menace to society and <laughs> boys in the hood and uh so we had you know there were like there was like beef in high school with like you know jocks and rappers and so we had you had to you know it was like the 90s like shit it was cool to be fucking thugged out you know nowadays yeah. it's cool to be like um uh, i don't know now it's cool not to be thugged out yeah it's way. not yeah i don't know it's almost like cooler to dress like a 80s hair metal front man and pop xanax and Use auto tune. I'm trying to think of like what's what's the hegemonic like top down profile for hip hop. I can't even think of one these days. It's kind of yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean now. I mean nowadays it is um, you know a hybrid of everything. It's punk meets mm -hmm. meets rich people meets you know you know everybody. I mean I'm all for it. I, I, you know I that's the kind of shit I listen to when I'm like listening to music. I listen to that kind of stuff. So I really. Can't, I can't hate on it too much. That's cool. I saw in an interview in my research, like um, you brought up artists, you know, like French Montana and like the, the big artists are like that. And you're like, yeah, I don't really talk shit about artists like that at the end of the day too much because I listen to that stuff too. And it's I, it's funny you mentioned French Montana because there's a track I'm working on right now that I'm like, you know, this feels like some French Montana shit. That's so wild. Like I'm not going to front so like I've done my research to a, a lot of hip hop artists and I'm always like, you know, seeing just like different sides of the game and i love the fact that you're out here like pushing anarchist stuff pushing you know self-farming stuff you're very very almost like if i can say like dystopian i feel very dystopian when i listen to your, your music sometimes in, in, a, in a sense but like in a, too. in a too, positive man. sense <laughs> but then over here you're playing pop that by french montana having a great time you know so it makes me laugh man it's true like you know my kid is like roaming around the house singing like polo g <laughs> <laughs> it's like i was just like we were like hey, he's like the other day i'm just like like uh oh no 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 we're like hanging out and like just out of the blue i it's not even shit i listened to it's just like something that came on a pandora it's like what you want today one phone call and they on their way and i'm like dude my kid is singing like this beautiful melody about like murdering people like it's messed up uh, it's hilarious <laughs> it's so funny to me oh i love that well let's keep it in the youth and hip-hop sectors but let's go back to soul's youth man um i interviewed a great mc from the state of maine named andre hicks 
and he dropped oh, your name. Shit. You remember Andre Hicks growing up with him at all? Yeah, he Any was um he was a mentor to me. He was really? like someone. He was the first. Well, anyway, finish your finish what you're gonna say. I was just pretty. You pretty much were gonna start talking. On I was just gonna say talk on like your relationship with him. Well, okay, back in the day, you know, there was 45 Below, which was like this existing crew, which was like Cuz the Highlander, this guy. Alias. Mm, yeah, Alias was later, though. Later, I mean, okay. Like, when I was like freshman in high school, there were like these older seniors at Deering. It was like 45 Below. It was like Mood Swing 9. Um, J.D. Walker? Wait, hold on. <laughs> no, no worries. No worries at all. What's up? Okay. Buddy, I'm doing an interview. I, okay. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> you say hi. Hi. Go. What up, youngin? All right. All right, buddy. Get go, go, go. Close the door and see mama. <laughs> no worries. Oh, that's, that's real. I hope you. I hope you edit this shit. <laughs> no, no worries. For all the uh, audio listeners, Soul's doing family stuff, and we don't judge because <laughs> you got to take care of your people. That's number one. Okay. All right. All right. So Andre Hicks, <laughs> Andre Hicks. Um, so yeah, there was like a crew of older kids basically. And this is like before I met alias or JD Walker, or any of those people. Got you. Got you. And, um, and yeah, they called themselves 45 below and Andre Hicks was sort of like the one everyone looked up to because he was rapping really fast. He could really, he just, had a great voice, was a good songwriter. He was just, you know, like the Nas of Portland, Maine, pretty much. And cool. um, everybody was just knew he was the shit. And um, yeah. And then I don't know. I, I uh, he, he went to jail when I was like 13 or 12 or something. I don't, I don't even remember. And so we'd had a few interactions and then he went to jail and then um you know, I, I think we, maybe we Facebook messaged or something, but I yeah. would love to see that dude sometime. Yeah, cool he's around. He, he's out here, man. He's in Portland, I think. That's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. He but mentioned yeah, you. He had, um, he just had some classic shit also because he was like one of the only people who like would write shit and like record it, you know, and like Cuz had like a four track or something. And so people would just, I can still remember like the lyrics. No code and at the time of acceleration, I should be a jag. I stack up, I bag up Robin Hood and all the good neighborhood. I had no hoods like Robin Hood who lived in the woods and chopped woods. No, I, can't, I can't remember the rest of it, Whoa. but he was, he was fucking good. He was That's fucking wild. Good. But like doing that Nas rhyme scheme shit and mm -hmm. rapping fast in the early 90s. You know what I mean? That's like, pretty big. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was really good. And I feel like quicker flows and faster rapping it wasn't often paired with maybe like the best bars at that time you know you have like your big daddy kings and stuff like that but a lot of it was kind of like in that double time just kind of like fun to hear it so it's cool that hicks was doing that man yeah um, I mean, he was a big inspiration for me it was just like back then it was like learning to flip the tongue is what we would call it like flipping to dip a dip now every now it's like the cheapest <laughs> yeah back call it like <laughs> mumble rap <laughs> um that's interesting, yeah. I did. I didn't know that he was kind of like you know, and a big figure to you like that. Um, what was Portland like at this time, man? Like, must be incredibly different, incredibly different. Well, it's weird. That's why I'm back here because it's not the same. This place is now like a mini San Francisco, basically. Mm. Um, but when I was a kid, it was like you know, it was white as fuck. Um, you know, it was before all that like refugee situation started happening and they started bringing people in from all over the world i mean there mm -hmm. was a few people from like kosovo and korea and stuff but like <clears throat> it wasn't until really over the last 20 years i think the combined influence of mecca and the um and refugees and just like portland becoming like herald in maine in general is like this really desirable place those things have coalesced to um produce you know, a lot of interesting shit. Like, it's just, it's weird to me that I can get like awesome, you know, vegan food and shit in, in places where my homies used to rent, you know, apartments and smoke cigarettes on the front <laughs> porch and shit. It's like, it's like the whole Munjoy Hill area. Portland just is totally different. I've um, heard, yeah. But, um, you know, basically, 
you know, shit was just different back then. You know, like we would go to this club called Zoots. I don't know if I know Zoots. Zoots yeah. Is that still a, a thing? No, I, but that was like when I did my research, there was like, you know, old articles about like Zoots closing and shit. And I was like, this place looked like it was popping back in the day, man. DJ Moshe used to wash dishes with Mood Swing 9. And that's like our connection. So those two, in when they were in their mid-teens, were working together. And so Moshe was like the main hip hop guy at Zoots. Yeah. And so we would go play shows uh, at Zoots and we would hop on open mics at some weird, I want to say Geno's, but I, I don't think it's Geno's. Like some random club used to have like open mic nights on Monday where yeah. be a bunch of old jazz dudes. And then like, <laughs> and then like a, all, like the, all the rappers like JD Walker, Kane, D, uh, Dal, KGB, you know, all of us used to go and we would like crash these ja old white dudes having their <laughs> jazz night open mic things and uh like Braden and uh I'm trying to think who else Kane Braden Biddings one? yeah yeah because he's the OG he did main hiphop.com I think back in the day he's like the original rhyme beat man he's like the oh really yeah I believe cool. so I think Shane Rice told me about that and someone else shouted him too there was like yeah um there was somebody out here like making a website and like trying to link rappers like 15 years ago so shout out yeah. to him doing that yeah he's another one who's just really great um and uh and yeah and so we would just go and crash these like but that's what you would have to do basically like it was there wasn't a hip-hop night there wasn't like portland maine now has like monday uh monday of the minds is one of the longest running hip-hop nights in the country and like it's very rare to see a scene like mm. that just as an aside um yeah and you know i just feel like you know things like i said it was just Portland, Maine in the 90s was kind of like just har harsher than mm. it is now. It was like lots of fighting. All I remember is just fighting all the time. People wanting to fight me everywhere I go, we get into fights and we'd always have to like posse up. And I don't feel like that's like the um, the vibe anymore Not in hip hop. You yeah. know what I mean? Like people are like, you know, their parents are feeding them arugula and shit now. You know what I mean? Like they're not... Uh, they're not living off pizza and, uh, and shit like that. You know yeah. what I mean? The so Beastie it's, Boys it's, diet has been switched for like, you know, probiotic and sweet potato <laughs> wraps. <laughs> I'm all for it. I'm same, all for no, it. Same, though, same. I'm all for it. But it's just like it, when I was growing up, like it was just, I just remember it being very violent. And when I would talk to people in other cities about like how violent it was, people would be very surprised, hmm. you know, that um, like I had my house shot at once by you know really people like yeah in portland you know? yeah damn rat because yeah. of rat beef um or just because no, of like no you know, it like was because beef. it was it was like we had our we had we had a little gang called the sa mob and um it was like a joke stevens avenue you know what i mean but at the <laughs> same time we thought we were badass yeah. you know we like jumped each other in and like that's just culturally people just fought like the hmm. toxic masculinity was how dudes expressed themselves back then and that's why like you know it's but it was i mean that's my that's my memory of it is just like fighting lots of fighting. yeah damn and, uh, you got shot up that's and, pretty serious yo yeah not many yeah my yeah it was on the news oh shit they fired <laughs> shots through my mother's room oh fuck that could have been a bad situation well i'm glad everyone I, I think it was just a 22. You know what I mean? I don't think anybody, but back then, like we thought it was cool. We we're like, Yo, yeah, we should go do a fucking drive by. You know what I mean? That'll be fucking cool. Let's yeah. go do a fucking Let's just have a who rifle gonna... out the window. <laughs> yeah. Who are we going to do a drive by on? Yeah. They didn't shoot up your whole crib with like three Uzis and a machine gun, you know, but <laughs> it probably felt yeah. like it at the time. Huh? Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. But yeah, just generally, like, um, you know, it was. It's not like we had, you know, but then we do things at like clubs like the BBC um, nightclub and uh, go to like places like Lewiston BBC and like battle people. It was like some, you know, it was like it was fucking cool. You know, it was cool because, um, you know, you really had to work for it. You know, if you were a white rapper, you had to be really fucking good because mm -hmm. even back then, most of the rappers were black dudes who were. um you know a lot you know generally speaking like it's not a, a white culture and so people are 
um, standoffish about white people coming into that space. And so it's like, it was, it, I feel like that kind of shit, um, I feel like I benefited from, from that situation. Like it, it like forced me to be original and competitive and Mm, feel that. Hell yeah. Well, I want to kind of talk. Oh, also, oh, I'm sorry. One last thing. And WMPG actually played a huge role in everything that we were doing. Talk on that. I, I work for them. I'm the hip hop director of WMPG, actually. So I have a lot of love for that station. So, I'd oh love, man, I'd love to hear how they impacted you early on. Um, yeah, like people like Bebop specifically, and this other guy Jason, and they had like hip hop shows, and every week I could just come down there and rap. They would let me rap on the radio station. Uh, Mark Curto, DJ from Hell, he had a uh, Shout radio out Curto. show. He had a show up in Wyndham at St. Joseph's College, I think it was called. And so we would like bounce between these radio stations and like freestyle on them. And like, and you know, people would call in and, uh, you know, analog world. It was just cool. Every, you know, everything wasn't at your fingertips. You had to like be tuning in for the WMPG new hip hop night at, you know, whatever time it was at. You had to like be listening from like four to seven and then. You know, if you were listening, you'd hear these rappers and we'd yeah. like, you know, walk around town and think we were fucking cool. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, and it was cool. And that was actually, that was really my segue into the music industry is um, through WMPG and Mark Curto actually like introduced me Whoa. to the people who, um, this guy, Jameson Grillo, um like i brought went to new york with curto one time when he was like shopping his band back in the day i forget what it was called and um through him i got in touch with people like dj shame jameson grillo and the people behind like big daddy distribution back then and those are the people that led to anticon's early distribution deals and um, all that stuff who would have thought that WMPG would lead to Anticon's distribution deals, man? For real. I mean, and there's also like a dark side to it where oh. I was getting hip hop shipped to me from WMPG's hip hop um, station for a while. I don't know how my address, it was a. It was oh, a, like the promos to put on the radio were getting sent promo, to you? Promos were ended up getting sent to my house. And uh, I, didn't qu- I didn't, yeah, I didn't quite figure out what was going on for that's okay the statute of limitations is probably passed on that one my friend so i think i didn't do it i didn't (laughs) allegedly (laughs) wow well you're hitting a lot of interesting points i mean shout out wmpg first off because i love them um curdo wcyy legend i was listening to him growing up now he does a lot of events at aura i believe in portland and i didn't know you guys had a relationship so that's wild to hear too yeah yeah that's beautiful yeah it's cool Yeah, you're firing up all these old neurons, man. I haven't thought about any of this shit. Well, let's get into it. I want to talk more. Like I said, I want to celebrate the present, the now, the most important part of life. But I still like to contextualize the work and, um, you know, especially if it's kind of unprecedented work in a sense. At the time, so, you know, when you're coming up, Portland didn't have a major hip hop scene, at least compared to even what it is now. And like I said, to me, you're a figure who's done a lot in this culture. I mean, I see you at Monday of the Minds for their four-year anniversary show, I think, last winter when uh, Chesky was here and he played. And I was just like, this is so wild to me, like seeing all this history in the building. Like, I feel like what you did and, you know, even, you know, Andre Hicks and what all y'all were doing at that time slowly started to influence what's happening now. So I just think it's so important to, you know, go back and remember what influences the the now. So that's kind of why I like hitting the past. Um, one question I have before we kind of talk about 45 below and you, um, you know, with Northern exposure and live poets, kind of that, that stuff. Oh, I know mad skills and unpaid bills. I did my research here. Um, was hip hop in your house at all growing up or was music in your house growing up? Like, were you exposed to any art forms like from your parents or just family members? You know, um we had like a casio keyboard that had like some shitty drums and a fisher price turntable and i definitely you know when i was a little kid i would like scratch on the fisher price turns because you could actually scratch on them that's cool the needles uh so yeah i would scratch my fisher price turntable and um you know play on my casio keyboard 
Um, but no, I didn't grow up like my dad had a guitar, but he never played it. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, and, uh, but I think like, like my mom sang all the time, you know what I mean? Like singing to the dogs and sing, you know what I mean? Just like just being like, musical. Yeah. 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 And so I think like that freestyle probably helped my, uh, freestyle abilities. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. And then the only other family, I mean, there are a few family like ties that come in, like my, cousin's boyfriend ended up working at a um recording studio in boston in like 93 92 92 when i was like 14 and he snuck me in after hours to record um this song called uh it's called like the, even if you prayed like hammer you couldn't touch mine it's like me rapping over the dwick instrumental and yeah. then uh then later on my that's primo um, right gangstar well it was a no it was a beat from Dwight. yeah it was a beat from primo but then it was like sampling full flush there's a thrush and a bus run d nice or something yeah yeah and, yeah. Uh, and then so like i sent that demo then i had that demo and then my aunt knew um someone who knew jermaine dupree's lawyer Whoa. and so i that demo got sent to my aunt and it was given to someone and like that was like at that point, like um, Criss Cross had just come out and Vanilla Ice was like one of the only white rappers. And so like instantly, like Jermaine Dupree's people were, you know, knocking on my door. And that's it was wild. Fucking weird. I mean, that's that shit fucks your head up when you're 14. Yeah. Because you, know? you started recording what your early demos at like 14, 15, I think. Yeah. 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 Um. Wow, what happened? How did that whole Jermaine Dupree thing play out? Just did it kind of fade out, or? Um, basically, my understanding of what happened is that my father didn't trust my uncle, who was representing me because I was a minor in Florida, and um, they had like worked out in advance and all this stuff. And um, my father basically called the people and blew the whole thing up. Damn. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, but you know, I never quite understood what happened until later. Yeah. Um, and um, it's probably a combination of both. Like, you know, it's just not worth it. Like, we'll just find someone else to fill to, to be this. Yeah. If I had been that, like, I would have. It was around the time they were putting out the brat. Like, you can only like they were like trying to get me Jermaine Dupree beats. Like, the I brat and soul together. I was like, I was like, I was like, I was like, I want pre. I want DJ Premier beats. I don't want Jermaine Dupree beats. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. And they were like, Primo is too expensive. Anyway. <laughs> That's cool. I like the history. That's interesting, man. Well, um, did you help form 45 Below Records? Or was that just the 45 Below crew already like having that and you were kind of an affiliate? I don't know. Um, yeah, the 45 Below crew existed. I don't know if they called it 45 Below Records. Yeah. When I, when I put out stuff in my teen years, I put it out as 45 below um you know like we weren't really worried or thinking about like money or anything and so it was just like selling tapes at the mall or you know we weren't yeah no one cared about like the business aspect yeah because there was no money we'll talk about the music from that time then i mentioned you know mad skills and unpaid bills i think you were in a, a duo called northern exposure is that correct with uh cuz yeah and then you had um cuz is mood swing yeah, yeah. He went by Cuz back poets. back then, right? And then yeah. um you were in live poets as well. So um what what do you think you were learning musically at this time? You know, was it just kind of like just we're soaking in it and just enjoying the moment, or did you have a goal in mind? Um, I feel like I was really really in that point in my life, I was really inspired by Black Moon um and like Duck Down and just Hell like yeah. their their independent. Uh, and I used to rap like Buckshot. I mean, I still kind of do. Um, mm. But back then I was definitely like, you know, I sounded like I was trying to, you know, uh, doing the Buckshot. They used to call me Buckshot Whitey. Back then. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I feel like that's what I was like referencing is that um, the kind of Wu-Tang, like I just thought like crews that like, like I just liked the model of a crew that yeah. ran a ran a label you know i like that model um i think i sort of bought into like you know you need the really smart 
dude at the center of it to, you know, make it happen. And sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, sometimes it's better if it's everybody working together. Um, mm. But back then I just, I kind of just wanted to, all I wanted to do, I had like this like high school revenge shit where I just had nothing but beef, beef in high school. And so all I wanted to do was like drive by in a limo um, <laughs> on graduation day and just give everyone the middle finger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I didn't even like graduate with my class. I ended up like basically getting ejected from school. So damn. Hey, well, it all worked out, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Um, how did you link with pedestrian initially? This, um, so this period you're talking about, it's like pre-internet. Um, there was like stuff like AOL and CompuServe. And like, if you had a computer, you could like connect with a modem through. Yeah, like dial like, up, right? Yeah, through, but it wasn't even to the internet. It was to like this, like these like gated communities like CompuServe, AOL, et cetera. And Chat so rooms and shit. Prodigy. So I was on Prodigy and just like in hip hop rooms, just like battling, posting stuff, trading tapes. And um, I made a, I basically was like super East Coast and was like had Northern exposure, had like lines dissing West Coast hip hop. And um, <laughs> so there's two things that happened there. One aspect of it is Mood Swing 9 got on the news groups, the hip hop news groups and started dubbing tapes himself, cause singles his, himself of our single, like an EP of just like his favorite songs. And then whoever wanted a copy on the news groups, he would send them to anyone mm. all over the United States. And this was like 93. And so our music just got in the hands of people. That's pretty cutting edge for the time, man. I feel like to do that. We were the first, we were like the, that's why Anacon blew up. Is because we were some of the first people to really use the internet this way. Yeah, distribute. Like you had like an independent distribution network, like the the kind of like the skeleton of it in a sense. It sounds like. Yeah, I mean, and at one point we actually had our own um, distribution company where we sold direct to hundreds of stores directly. That's uh, so wild. Man. Damn. It was a different fucking time, man. So. Wild. Um. Yeah, and then so so basically, like I was trading tapes and rat and engaging in hip-hop shit online connecting with people and then pedestrian heard my shit and was like you're dope but like that line the west coast is whack and miami bass is whacker like you don't know shit about west coast underground hip-hop and then so he started sending me tapes of like freestyle fellowship um lyricist lounge and shit too right or no that's the um, lyricist project blow excuse me project blow so, exactly yeah. exactly he started sending yep. me all that stuff and then like instantly like my tastes changed. I went from like being all about like organized confusion and Hell. Nas and Black Moon. And then like, then I discovered Mike and Nine and AC alone and all this mm. like, Saphir, these people doing crazy shit. Wild like, shit. Like freestyle. Crazy. If you at home, not to interrupt, but if you at home haven't peeped any of the freestyle fellowship or like Project Blow, like abstract rude, that kind of stuff, man, please do it. Very different type of hip hop. Very, very fun and awesome and i think forward thinking but back to soul yeah and so that's stuff and yeah and so that's it so that's how we you know that's what that's our connection and then at a certain point he ended up moving in with some woman in connecticut and then it all went bad and he didn't know anyone else on the coast and so me and some people me and jd walker and another friend um, he, I mean, he just called me. He's like, I'm at work. My girl just showed up at my work with all my shit. Like, you know, can you guys help me out? And I'm like, fuck yeah. And he went and lived in JD Walker's closet for, Whoa. you know, a couple of years. Um, and so we like just drove out there, picked him up and he rented a closet from JD for a while and, uh, stayed here. And then we moved to California. Yeah. Let's get into that. Cause I mean, for those who don't know too, Anticon is one of the biggest, uh, I think labels of, I'd say, like late 90s, early millennium, y'all were with anybody, I'd say, in your field. Um, and the fact that, yo, like it started in Portland, Maine, a lot of it always will blow my mind. Like people don't know the history of that. You probably told this countless times. And I don't want to um, take up too much of your time recalling it, but can you just talk about how Anticon kind of formed initially, like at that time period when you were all together? 
Um, well, it's it's part of like that that like initial networking by Mood Swing Nine, pedestrian. Like we all just started trading tapes, and then through that, um, I got a Dose One tape. I got a Atmosphere album. I got you know early was, too. Like this is late '90s, so like this is probably before even Rhyme Sayers was a prominent thing, right? Um, yes and no. I mean, Rhyme Sayers had built something incredible already yeah like you know when we would show up and like when we went to record deep puddle we played like a sold out show you know what oh, i mean no shit Chica- yeah, yeah. they were already selling out shows in chicago just based off the strength of scapegoat being played on the radio like yeah, back cause... then back then if your stuff was played on a college radio that people because people actually fucked with college radio people actually read herb unsigned hype people actually like read these things um and uh yeah and so oh and overcast nothing true but overcast by atmosphere actually with spawn had come out probably right around this time period too yes. right so that yeah. had that was a huge record too yeah 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 and so like we were out recording deep so we just all like heard each other's music deep puddle we all liked it and um and then just made this record and then um just realized that like we all kind of had something that was kind of rare at that point and we just were like fuck it let's we like making this record let's all move to california together like me and pedestrian were already moving to the bay yeah then dose moved out you know why odd no Stom, alias dj mayonnaise um mood swing nine everyone just started moving out there me and pedestrian wow got got an apartment out there and then just people at one point we had like 13 people living in a two and a half bedroom house in Lake Mira, Oakland. That's wild. But that's how you do it, you know? And then uh you know and then then the next thing you know everybody's living everywhere and um yeah so I feel like what was the question? How did it start? Yeah like how did so was it the series of y'all um trading your music with other underground artists in different pockets of the country kind of is what formed yeah. that network. No shit. Yeah. Because yeah, for those who don't know at home, not to interrupt again, but Anticon released, I think you had before deep puddle dynamics drop, what there was like hip hop music for the advanced listener and like music mm-hmm. for the advancement of hip hop. Those were some collab projects, but then the taste of rain. Why Neil was soul um, slug of atmosphere, other members of um, Anticon all like linking up and putting on a project, which then embarked kind of with the Western migration of all y'all moving to Oakland, right? Yep. No shit. Sweet. Yep. All right. My history's. I'm, I'm getting it. I feel like I got a pretty good timeline here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Deep Puddle, but Deep Puddle like floated around on like Napster and tape trades for years and years before it ever came out. And interesting. Like, and so I feel like that like really lent it because like we, we were like always looking for like the proper distribution, you yeah. know what I mean? Uh, for our shit, um, which helped us quite a deal. Um, but in the meantime, our stuff was like circular. Like we'd have like these like tape trader kids come and stay at our house um, from like message boards or whatever. And we just let them record whatever. We weren't like protective about our shit. So there'd be all these like yeah. dubs of demos just floating around on Napster and like people would trade them and like, um it i mean it really would help like we'd go to places and people would be like packed shows of people like wanting to hear stuff that wasn't even out you know that's nuts yo shout shout out i mean i know like metallica got on their high horse and freaked out and like took napster down but as an independent artist you can't put a price tag on that kind of like distribution for people i feel like you know like that's huge yo no everything's fucked now i mean like what so you're (laughs) <laughs> yeah just don't even get me started no, i don't want to do that yeah if i hear everything's fucked now i'm like we gotta we gotta stop i'm gonna <laughs> we can get to that in a little bit um yeah it's all good yeah always always um but sweet i mean what was moving to you said oakland right the bay what was that yeah like? initially i moved to san francisco with the tenderloin i mean it was i mean it was like it was culture shock um but i was like so young i just didn't it's like 20 i, I just didn't I mean, it was, it was also fucking easy because, you know, we were all able, like I had, like, I was working at Blue Cross and Blue Shield doing tech support stuff in Maine. Mm. Um, and so when I moved to the Bay, I literally was able to make like $50,000 a year with no college degree, just, just showing up. You know what I mean? Um, and That's good money back then too, man. 
that's good money now straight up straight up it that's is. more i don't know a lot of people who make that kind of money now yeah um and uh and yeah and so all the homies everybody moved out there got like temp jobs um working at charles schwab and all these places and like you know everybody was just making a lot making way more money doing like similar data entry shit that we were doing back in maine except making like twice as much three times as much money um and we were like thrusting like you know all of a sudden all these like main main people but other like gel was from chicago we're all, we're all like working in skyscrapers and that's so wild. you know so it's like in the morning we're like getting on the bart to go to san francisco to like work in skyscrapers and then at night we're like you know you know whatever discovering international cuisine and getting high and making yeah music was the weed major major different out there i didn't really smoke weed when i lived in maine yeah. so um i mean it was obviously the bay area has had very you know you could get really good medicinal quality weed back then too so that's wow um, sweet yeah, so. Well, let's talk about some music, if we may. Um, you dropped Bottle of Humans, I think, in 2000. Um, your debut, right? I dropped, like five, I dropped like five versions of that album. It was basically like a mixtape that I just kept updating. And then finally, yeah. I was like, okay, No Stom made a version of it that I was like, all right, I trust you. This is this is like, you know, there were like 20-something songs that were on various versions of it. Yeah. And finally, yeah. Was that like your, your kind of debut, like yeah. solo tape? What yeah, was it like to have that out finally? You know, you have all this wild stuff moving. You're in Cali, you know, you're doing internet stuff. You're doing um, like actual, like, you know, in person, selling out shows or at least being at shows based off internet presence. But how did it feel to actually get like a body of work out? Um, I mean, honestly, one? I never really, Bodily Humans was never really, it was never the record I was like really working on. It was just like songs that mm. I, it was basically like a mixtape. Um, yeah. Like it, it was the stuff I was working on with mood swing that um, I was really excited about. And then that project fell apart. Um, but the, so I never really, I was never really that psyched off bodily humans. I was psyched that like I could get, you know, $10 for a bootleg CDR, yeah. you know, and then I could keep pressing them and, you know, selling them at Amoeba or whatever and making really, you know, decent income from that. I mean, that, what was crazy to me is like, I was, I was like, I, I like doing tech support shit. I like the comfort of like making a lot of money to do nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, I was just happy to just play shows every once in a while, put out music and work for the rest of my life. And yeah. then, um, then at a certain point, I was just, just didn't want to work anymore. I just wanted to make music. Um, yeah then we can get into that more because you also um were in a i think a group called so-called artists at that time or like s similar in that time period am i tripping yeah yeah i mean we we made a record for mush because we yeah. needed money money basically God mush you. mush was just trying to like throw money at anyone associated with the intercon and use the exact same outlets that we had built up ourselves uh yeah. to you know and so we were like you know fuck it we we're like in the real world you know for the first time so it's like yeah we'll we'll take we'll take some money how, um, hell yeah and, how um uh, how young are you when anticon started kind of like popping off and getting that notoriety 20 21 damn 22. what's it like to see that i mean not like immediate success but you're pretty young and pretty popping pretty early on yeah i mean it fucks your head up to be honest um because we didn't have management we didn't have mentors. And so we were just a bunch of like, for lack of a better word, a bunch of like, um, just a bunch of dudes with a whole bunch of fucking issues that had never really been socialized in how to like work cooperatively in a collective or any of the, any of the things that like precipitate the reason why doom tree is successful and still around because like they, those for the, I mean, aside from like, the fucked up shit that's gone on with uh allegations of rape lately or whatever but i'm sure yeah that, there's a good I'm dj sure. i think in that but yeah i know what you're but, talking about but i mean like generally speaking like a, a, a place like doom tree works what worked on their friendships for years and years and years those people were like really good friends whereas mm. anacon was just a bunch of people coming together not really knowing each other 
And then all of a sudden there's all the success. Um, and so it's like for me to go from like being like the nerdy video game kid in high school um, to go to, you know, who's like playing Starcraft all the time and shit like <laughs> to, to go from that to being like people kissing my ass and shit. Uh, at 21 years old at that, you know? Yeah. And it it's makes you like, it makes you like not trust people. Basically it made me because of like the way I was, it just made me not really trust people. Maybe, yeah. um, you know, and we all just thought we were fucking cool. A lot of times people who go around thinking they're fucking cool are doing so out of insecurity or whatever. Mm -hmm. um and uh, i'm sure all those things are true about that time period but in generally <laughs> speaking it's fucking awesome i mean it's an incredible feeling to one i didn't even know how to do my laundry when i lived in maine you know what i mean to go yeah. from like that to being like oh now we're eating this crazy food people are like loving our music we're having to we're dealing with all this adversity and all this like difficulty but all this like these challenges are like we're in europe we're going to all these places and it was um yeah because you were you touring at the time too yeah i didn't really start touring so, like selling live water was really when everything came perfect together. that was that's a, a tremendous transition because i wanted to talk about selling live water and then after that you moved to barcelona correct yeah talk about that album talk about selling live water and touring so like, you know, you were asking me about bodily humans and all this stuff, like, how did it feel? It didn't feel any way because it was all gradual. It's like when you're slowly cooking a frog, like the frog. <laughs> you you got it. Yeah. You got to turn it. <laughs> yeah. I just, I still felt like I was like this hungry, thirsty rapper and shit. Um, and, uh, and then, and honestly, I think I'd never really had a lot of confidence in my own art. Like, even though I moved all the way around the country, I mm. saw myself as more of like a label dude, like somebody who made things happen, you know, as I had a business mind. Um, and so like, you know, putting out like Sage Francis or putting out themselves or buck 65, like making those rec, seeing through those records and helping those things happen. Um, was like really important to me. And, and like, it was hard for me to like really get behind my own shit and get excited about it and push it and self promote. It was easier for me to promote other people's shit. Um, and so when selling live water happened all at this point, you know, we've built up our own distribution company. We've got relationships with like top tier um, publicists because the people because we have like an affiliation, a loose affiliation through like Sonic Youth and Beck's management yeah. um, through this guy who was helping us <clears throat> potentially going to um, manage <clears throat> us, maybe not. Um, and so he got us a deal with like Southern Distribution who does like Discord, mm. Constellation Records, like a really big punk um, indie rock distributor in Europe. <clears throat> and so like for this next round of records like themselves, the no music, Sage Francis, um, soul selling live water. All these records went through this machine where there was like, there was a label manager who was like overseeing it. There was <clears throat> merchandising people who were doing this. There were booking agents here. There were booking agents here. Um, you know, we'd gotten enough press. We'd gotten enough hype um to have like big distribution <clears throat> at that point like we'd like done all the little things back then it's like you you get a few pieces of press you prove that you can sell a couple thousand copies yeah play a couple shows and then bam like you can get a distribution deal you can start getting into bigger magazines you can start getting into bigger stores playing bigger shows mm -hmm. that trajectory no longer exists nope. like that whole trajectory is just fucking trashed for new artists and and it's fucked because w I was able to build a working class living, getting to that point, like, you know, earning income by selling 10 CDs. That's a hundred dollars. You know, yeah. you, you hang out in front of Amoeba records for a month, you know, you're going to like, we would make like a thousand, 2000 bucks a month, just, just with Amoeba records, you know, me personally, it's fucking insane. You, just can't, you can't imagine earning more money from one record store in Berkeley 
then you but it was like again amoebas was like the anti-fat beats you know it was like people were selling mystic journeyman cdr it's like people were just like doing super diy stuff over yeah. there um but then when selling live water happened bam i'm in europe i am like playing like squats um in in like places like greece you know i'm like doing tours going from portugal to israel i'm you know going to japan i'm going to australia i'm you know playing shows all over the u.s and it was just fucking at the time it was really stressful it felt like we were all at each other's throats all the time like always worrying about money and all this shit um and uh but really those i mean that those were like you know in some ways like the days you know that was like when shit was like shit was just just getting to that point and uh we were like really well situated at that point and so i was like I was like, man, I've kind of done all I really needed to do in Oakland. Like I make a record, I sit around for nine months for it to come out. Like, I'm not really like, I tried going to college. I didn't really like it. What'd you study? Political science and logic. Mm -hmm. um, and I just didn't like it. I was just like, I don't, I don't want to do busy work. I like to read. Like, yeah. I don't need to do all this crap. Like, um, and so, yeah. And at the time I, you know, had a woman I was in a relationship with for a couple of years and um, I was like, hey, let's like, you know, I get way more money in Europe than I do in the States. Let's just go live in Europe for a little while. You know, let's go live in. We didn't even know where we were going to live. We we're like, yeah. I, I, I just told my booking agent, I was like, hey, I'm thinking about moving to Europe, um, probably Spain. And uh, he was like, cool, I will book you a tour from Portugal to Israel. It was like two and a half months. And we like, we played Serbia, Bosnia, drove through Macedonia. We were, in, Is we were in Israel, like when it was like right after they had like assassinated the spiritual leader of Hamas, like all the Western groups had canceled. Like I was in Serbia on that tour we were in Serbia. There were like uh, riots, like there was like tear gas in, the, in our show, you know, um, do you still, did you finish the show? Yeah. That's commitment. Yeah. Holy shit. Man. Yeah. I was like in, in Israel, I was like, yo, I, I was like, I don't like uh, Israeli soldiers were opening for me and shit. I was like, I don't, this isn't really the side I want uh, <laughs> to like die on. If there's a terrorist attack, I don't want, this isn't, this isn't where my allegiances really lie. Yeah. I'm, to, I'm a tour and artist here. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying to get a check. <laughs> I'm with the Palestinians. I'm not yeah. Oh yeah. And then, then a whole different other like political side to it. Yeah. Holy shit. I didn't know your touring was that extensive throughout that area. Yeah. I mean, I basically toured three to six months out of the year for forever until Really, until I moved to Denver and just decided to stop. Yeah, well, we got some other points to get into in the ten-year story of Soul. Um, what made you but pick yeah, Bar but, Barcelona? But, but basically, I will say the selling live water basically set me up for I want to say for life. Basically, like the really? success of that record, um, the the just the impact that it had, just opened doors for me. And um, you know, I would say in many ways that's like the height of my fame. You know, mm -hmm. um, and but I like that just from everything I've done since then. And from then it's like, a, uh, it's been a, that's been my job since then. Like that, just getting to that point, like set, like this is the baseline now. Yeah. Um, you get to, you get to be this person, which Hell is, yeah, man. which is crazy. It's crazy. to think after 20 years, I'm still doing this as a job. You did know, you ever th i mean briefly did you think you'd be here now like when you were making that record you're like i'm still here now man like that's pretty wild no we didn't even know <laughs> if it was good you know? <laughs> yeah yeah we didn't well, know let's talk about um your time in europe um did you pick barcelona for any reason or kind of was it just like i like this place it was in our travels let's stay here um yeah i mean we we when we got married we went and like honeymooned or lived we like rented a place for three months in southern um in southern spain and then we're like we're just gonna go across europe and pick a place we lived i thought we'd end up in france to yep. be honest um but then we just something about spain was just so like weird it was it's such a weird place in that time because um 
it just felt like it was like trapped in the 90s in some way it was just really just weird and barcelona is such a unique i don't know if have you been to barcelona yeah i i wanted to talk about barcelona because i've been there and i was blown away by the architecture i still like we'll just be chilling and i'll have like memories of the rambla kind of pop in my head of that long strip there they had of like shopping i'm just like man it's just something's the fuck is the energy out here like i like it it's it's a little different out here i don't, I don't know what it was but i love my time i was there for three days and i love my time there a lot so yeah i mean so you know that was like so like that was like a cool period because basically like i'm like getting moroccan hash like you can't get moroccan hashish hash. there we you go can't, man. you can't get <laughs> i've never smoked anything like it it's like the best thing in the world like period um and uh and so i just you know we 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 lived, we lived right over park well um mm -hmm. huge huge patio we paid like i don't even know like a thousand eight hundred euros a month to live right right park well was our backyard you know yeah. and and uh and it was just fucking crazy you know we'd like like it was cheap it was awesome um and like those ancient just that ancient shit. I mean, it's like, I think somehow it like speaks to me because I'm from Portland, Maine. I grew up around cobblestones, but like, yeah. I don't, and brick. I don't, I don't, um, I don't growing up. I don't think of that stuff as like this, like, you know, ancient shit or something. It's like, Oh, that's just where I'm from. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I'm saying? 100%. Um, yeah. And like, and so Barcelona is like, like just that, the, that whole dungeon area, that whole, like the, the, I don't know if it's the Gothic or, yeah, I, think, I don't know. Just it's awesome. Um, yeah, I love. It. If you can go to Barcelona ever, especially maybe when this pandemic's not still going on, do it. It's a beautiful place. But um, but you know, just be. But it also blew my mind living in Europe because I didn't. I, I didn't go to college. I'm not like educated. I'm not. I didn't read a lot as a kid. I um, don't know shit about history. And I'm meeting all these people my age and younger in Europe in all these political spaces who are like challenging the things I'm saying, talking to me about like, I'm, this is where I'm coming in contact with like communists and anarchists and playing in anarchist spaces. And like, you know, I'm, I was like in Barcelona, Catalonia, where the history of like the Spanish civil war is rich. And like, I tried to understand it, but I was still like too detached to really. So it's like, I'm just like hanging out on balconies, like smoking hash, reading you know political texts and like romantic poets and like you know living out this like sort of Kerouacian yeah. beat poet uh, beat, fan yeah. fantasy basically you know like mm -hmm. living the life i i uh you know wanted to live that's um, amazing holy shit yeah because otherwise i'd just be sitting in an apartment in oakland like i wasn't like you know i was making music but it's like how much music like it does it, how much music can i make like yeah I just didn't um because at that time i was no longer really doing the business stuff with anticon um i had stepped away from doing the business stuff and we created like this collective situation where like you know everything was handled and yeah. um i felt like okay cool we've got this machine going now we can go out and like and live you know go out and like experience the world try to learn some things and you know take what we're doing seriously and yeah you tremendous know, li live as if we are free yeah well you continue to move around after your time in barcelona i believe and then did you go to arizona after that mm -hmm. and is that where soul and the skyrider band formed yes yeah, soul and the skyrider band um talk on that for the people at home who don't know what that is so I don't know if you know who Bluebird is. Bluebird is a rapper I collaborated with a lot. He's one of my really good friends. Rings of Bell heavy. Yeah, like we did a lot of touring together in Europe and like I produced a bunch of stuff for him and he's just my homie. Um, he used to do a lot of shit with like Santiago um, and uh, Astronautilus down here in Portland. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, he, he was working with a band and so one day I just got like, you know, just through my internet message board shit, I got asked to play some like weird show in an olive grove in an orange grove in florida and i was like that sounds fucking awesome yeah um it's like some weird 
I don't, I don't want to say weird internet kids because they could be listening to this, but it was just some dudes that <laughs> I, I only knew from the internet. I was like, yeah, just a whole bunch of kids from like the Anacon message board, basically. Mm -hmm. So it was like they brought Skyrider, Astronautilus, and Soul. And, uh, and so we all went to this weird ass. It was, it was the whole thing was just fucking weird. Um, but it was, I remember we were all what do you hanging mean? out. Like, like, what kind of weird? <laughs> like it was at some weird, like new venue. Like we were mostly kicking it on this orange grove, which is like where the, where everyone was, Yeah. Uh, where someone owned the property. It was fucking beautiful. It was like, you expected a dinosaur to pop up out of the lake, you know, Jurassic was, park shit. <laughs> it was fucking beautiful. And, uh, and I just remember the smell of oranges just being so blown away by oh, it. And I'm like, we're all like, you know, just hanging out. And then um, that's where I met Skyrider and the band. And we ended up going back to Orlando and I stayed with them. And I just saw what Skyrider was doing. Like he had like cool beats that were sort of, I don't know, sort of no stomach, I guess at the time. And then, um, but then he was working with this drummer, John, who um, later goes on to be Fake Four's label manager no uh, shit for a while yeah before jeep um john was this incredible drummer and so he was like the drummer and then ryan was like this fucking he and ryan has gone on to do really incredible film work i mean he's you know the bill nye the science guy he just does all this incredible shit and mm. um and he was like you know he could play violin cello i mean he was just a one of the biggest geniuses I've ever met in my Renaissance life. Renaissance man. Just fucking like you could give him a fucking can and he could tune it. You know, he's just like, <laughs> like you know, uh, savant, total savant. Like, Got you, idiot savant. You know what I mean? In the yeah. in the best possible way. I, I deep admiration for. And uh, and I just heard what they were doing. They were doing this like Godspeed hip hop shit, and I was like, that is exactly what I want. Almost like Godspeed, you Black Emperor. You mean? That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's exactly what I want to do. That's what I'm into. Um, do you guys? Because they were getting ready to move to Montreal to work with Endemic Records, and I was like, Endemic. Re <laughs> say it, like, you gotta say it. <laughs> I was like, hey man, Endemic Records ain't gonna do shit for you. You're like, you wanna fuck with me? Like, we can get some shit popping. We got a distribution a network. Come on. Yeah, like, come on, come up here, stay with me for a month. Let's make a record. Then you go to Canada. Uh, but you know, and then so we they came. We made a record in Flagstaff, and um, and then they they just decided to stay. We loved it in Flagstaff. Um, Northern Arizona is <clears throat> my favorite uh, shit in the United States, North America. It's really I've never been there. Those red rocks. Is Sedona out there? Is Sedona North? I've been to <laughs> Sedona. I was blown away by the, by the stillness and just like the natural beauty of it for sure. So yeah, we lived three years in Flagstaff and then we lived in the national forest uh, outside of Sedona on Whoa. the creek for like two years. Holy was, shit. That was fucking They have all crazy. the coke, uh, the Coco Pellies are down there, right? That's like a, a, a cultural sign there. I forget what, what it looks like. It was like a figure holding an instrument dancing. My, my parents had always, it was like a tourist and they'd be like, look over there, there's another one. So I, I always remember Yeah, that. it's like a hope, it's a Hopi, um, some sort of Hopi yeah. representation. That's a beautiful yeah, area. I'm, 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 you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like, you know, you drive across the country and you're like, where can I go fucking swimming? You know, I grew up around Sebago Lake. Like I want to be in the water and a lot of mm. places are fucking cold, you know, like through that warmer, but like that water over there is just beautiful. But yeah, so we, you know, we did that record. Um, and, and at the time it was just like too ambitious of a project, like four, four, four band members in a car. Um, the situation at Anticon was becoming stressful mm -hmm. and um, and uh, it just wasn't, you know, like it's easy when everything's new, but then to keep things moving, you have to really, everybody has to be on the same page, moving together, mm -hmm. being strategic about how things are done. And, um, you know, we had had like a, so yeah, a bunch of shit just went, started to go bad. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, you don't have to talk too much on it because you've probably, again, talked on this a lot, but this is yeah. at the same time period where you parted ways with Anticon, correct? Yeah, a little yeah. bit after this. This was, yeah. like, this was it for me. That's um, why you dropped two albums on the Anticon with um, the Skyrider band and then one on Fake Four, I think. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. And, 
Yeah. And so, but you know, basically like that was just cool. Like we did like three, we did like a three month tour in the U S just like, just grinding, you know, just fucking grind. Like, and, um, and we just had, I mean, it was a hard time. It was hard. We didn't make much money. It's like difficult to sustain for adults full time off of a band. You have to just constantly mm-hmm. be on the road. And at a certain point, it was just like, you know, um, the other dudes in the band uh, are basically like, you know, we, uh, we can't like just keep doing this. Like it's not, um, we all knew it was like after hello crew world, um, what we thought like that was going to be the big record that just destroyed everything um in it and so we just decided you know we're going to stop doing this um we, it's not sustainable um we made the music we wanted to make we had some great shows like maybe we'll do it again but it's just like not sustainable and i yeah. we just couldn't do it anymore yeah and then i um, afford it and um yeah and then briefly like in your own words what was it like when you left Anticon, like after that? Uh, that was sad. I mean, that was a sad, I mean, I was really sad about it, you know, because I. You started it. I mean, you're one of the founders of Anticon, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm the founder, you know what I mean? Like um, I, I, I started it with credit cards and, you know, doing all the business for years like that, you know? Um, and then I'm like reading all this radical shit around that time about like um, ownership, you know, you don't want to own your friends. You don't, I didn't want to be a boss. I didn't want, like, I, I love these people. I didn't want to be responsible for them, but also it was really difficult. Like we're talking about distributors not wanting to pay you $50,000 kind of shit, like big, that's, that's, that's big shit. You need that. It's, that's your, that's your, that's your life. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it was like, you know, it was really stressful. I kind of had like a, I just, it, it, I didn't enjoy running a label. I didn't enjoy being a middleman. And so I was more than happy to, cause the way I felt like, okay, if we built something solid, then what's good for one person should be good, good for everyone. Otherwise the shit don't work. Yeah. And uh, basically what ended up happening was, the people running the business got real comfortable and felt less and less um, like they were working for us and uh, thought that they were like, you know. Um, so to be free of all that felt fucking good because I yeah. had a dark, dark cloud over my head from like 2007 to 2010. Mm-hmm. Um, of just dealing with the constant negativity. Yeah. Like if you listen, if you listen to my music from that period, it's all about like songs about fucking betrayal and shit. And it's like, dude, nobody wants to hear fucking brooding dark songs yeah. about fucking betrayal. Like, <laughs> dude, nobody wants to hear that shit. So it's like, it's just good to close it, close, close that whole chapter. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, and then like, but then what's crazy is I went from like literally like uh, making nothing to all of a sudden I get, you know, between 500 and a thousand bucks a month automatically from royalties. Um, Just, I went from like not getting paid at all to bam. Now all of a sudden I have like all my baseline bills paid just from work I've already done. And I was like, this is, and then I told everyone at Anacon, I was like, this is fucked up. You guys like, all of a sudden I'm not broke anymore. Like y'all need to fix this shit. Y'all need to fucking fix this shit. Like someone is fucking eating off of your fucking back. Like, like fuck that shit. Yeah, know? man. Um, And so it was good. And then that's when I became an activist and shit. And that's what I was like, yeah, just, I, I had music shit coming in. I didn't have to worry about it. And so I just spent all my time in this, in the streets, just organizing. This is a perfect time period or a transition period, because I feel like, you leave Anticon, you've done this traveling, you got to see parts of the world, expanded your mind with different, um, you know, political theories and amazing Moroccan hash out in Europe. And um, you also link with Fake Four at this time, I think, for one of the uh, Skyrider albums, right? Yep. Yeah. And then you moved to Denver pretty in that same time period, right? And then you get big in the Occupy movement in Denver, correct? Yep. Hell yeah. Well, um, 
how'd you link with we'll get into i want to get into denver and everything but how'd you link with fake four initially because that's an amazing way i know i known chesky since he was like a little kid how'd you meet chesky um you know him and like mike king and david and some other you know it was like back in the day it was like if you were like an excited internet kid who like was all into trading tapes and shit and you and you hit us up and wanted to come through like we we'd pretty much be down to hang out you know <laughs> um and uh which seems it's just it's just so weird there was just always so many people around it's weird yeah. now to think like we have there were just like random people just people just houses. hanging around <laughs> yeah um yeah sleep like we just think nothing of just letting everybody sleep on the couch a lot of trust a lot of blind trust with people <laughs> we had nothing so please take whatever um but uh what was the question just linking with oh, fake four. Chesky. So Chesky yeah. showed up with um, some folks one day and was like, we're working on this song. Do you guys want to get on it? We're like, sure. And we like wrapped on their shit. And, uh, um, you know, and then I just was always kind of friendly with Chesky um, and David. And, um, and um, yeah. And then I don't really know exactly how we oh here's how we reconnected soul and the skyrider band were on tour um we ended up playing a show with chesky in nice. new hampshire and then he was like oh do you guys need a place to stay and you can stay at my mother's house and so we went back and like stayed at his place and then he was like telling me about his label and um how he was like getting ready to work with like some new henry stuff and yeah. um just like what he was back then he was like i'm a gray skull and uh and you know, we just, you know, just kept talking and then, um, went on, a, I went on a bunch of tours with Chesky around that time, like me and Chesky and AWOL and Factor or me and Mike and I and Chesky. Factor um, Chandelier. Yeah. Dope and, producer. Uh, great producer. Dope I, I producer. I'm really hoping to do more, a, a bunch of music with Factor this year. We could do. He did a project with uh, Dope Knife, I think, recently too. That I fucked with heavy. He's great, man. Yeah. He's he really he's he's a good guy. And you know, so we just did a couple of tours, and like, this is like part of why I was able to leave Anacon because I felt like I had been like inducted into this Fake Four family, and I was part of. Um, I felt supported. I felt way more supported by Fake Four at this point than I did by the label I started. And I was like, you started a label and you're in it for what, like at least a decade, and then you link up with some a new label and it hasn't even been like what a couple of years, and you already feel more at home. It sounds like. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot more to that. I mean, basically, it's like, um, the person running Anticon really didn't give a fuck anymore about the OGs, Sean Caplow. He bankrupted the label. The label is defunct now. Yeah, it's gone. Like totally, he's lucky he never got um, tried. Uh, he, he's lucky no one pressed charges against him for like criminal negligence. The mm. the shit he pulled. Um, Whack. And but you know, but whatever. I complained about it for long enough, and I was the only one willing to move on it, and so I. You know, I pulled my shit now. <laughs> now I own a farm, you know? Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so yeah. So, but so it was like, you know, it was like I was getting the negative vibe over from, from that person. But also I like, I don't mean to, I can't put it all on Anticon. I was a difficult person. I'm a hot headed person. I'm like, you know, um, it's not like it's all one, one sided here. Like I'm a, diff I'm a difficult person. Respect to you saying that though. A lot of people want to be like, putting that self-awareness you know into the conversation but that's important yeah i mean i have to i mean i have to reflect on it you know um because um i want to grow <laughs> don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past right yep. um 100%. and uh yeah and so you know i just like and i just i just i just love chesky you know i mean and, uh, and he's immensely talented i mean I, yeah. chesky's fucking stupid good stupid talent there's so many times where I've watched Chesky and I've literally felt like, you know what, like if I have to pass a torch, I want to pass it to him. Like, uh, like I feel like um, he is just so incredibly talented that um, it's just like, I just, I watch him and I'm just like, man, it's no bullshit. It's no, I mean, 
sure maybe the guitar is like a quote-unquote gimmick but it's not a gimmick it's like a real yeah he spazzes with it. him yeah. but i mean like you can't do a one person show that's that good um without like result resorting to a lot of gimmicks and yeah just the way just watching him just rap uh I just love Chesky. Anyway, see, so yeah, I would put out a record with Fake Four. Shout out Fake um, Four. Yeah, and I still, I still fuck with Fake Four. I still work with Fake Four for distribution. I still like they distribute all the Soul and Pain One stuff. Um, DJ Pain One. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, um, I've, I've, I'm trying to, yeah. Yeah, I, I fuck with Fake Four a lot. So, Hell yeah. Shout out Fake um, Four. Well, yeah. I kind of bring them up too because I had a very interesting question. Did you guys get a little B feature on one of your albums? What was there a li- was was little B on one of your albums? Hell how, yeah! How the fuck did you link with, with that? Wasn't a sample, right? That's actually like a little B feature. Mm-hmm. How did you link with little it B? It was right before he started blowing up. Like yeah, I was cause... really into his shit um, around two thousand nine or something, and then like I just was really liking what he was doing at the time. What track and... do you remember? Was it like the Wanton Soup, Ellen DeGeneres? It was era. previous. It was the yeah. stuff before that. It was the stuff I want to say, like oh, with the pack, like vans and stuff like that. It was no. It was um. There's one. I want to say six kiss, six kiss. Little B six kiss. I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah. I'm I'm God. Um, all oh, these songs. The, the clams casino stuff. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. clams casino stuff. I was just like, I heard that shit, and I was like, dude, this is like, um, I felt like this is what a lot of people do and they make this mistake. They see someone successful doing something that they think is like close to what they do. And so you think, Oh, if I do this, 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 then this, and this, and this is going to happen. Like, okay. I'm a, I'm known from like my offbeat emotional stuff over like ethereal music. Um, So if I do a song with little B who does, this stuff over ethereal music then like it's going to lead to some crossover and it's going to like i'm going to get like a huge fan base bump. Yeah. um and like people make that mistake a lot heavy and very very rarely does it result in and it's the only time i've really like paid someone to rap on something yeah um and the whole the whole experience was actually kind of negative for me like he um he like yeah, it just, it, 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 I don't, I'm not, I'm not into like buying verses and shit. But yeah. anyway, it was really cool that we fucking did that song though. Um, it, uh, you know, it was cool. It's like, no, he's not appeared on anyone else's shit ever. So it's like, yeah, he's, cool. he's never really a jumps on like little B doesn't do a lot of features, man. But yeah, it was like, we were, you know, we paid him and he got on it and it was, it was cool. We, got to do a song about the economy and shit I mean, it's but I pretty think, wild bro like soul and the bass god on a track together come on man like, and then like yeah and then my homies who worked at ubisoft at the time and like work on all these like big ass video games yeah, video game company yeah we're like yo we'll make it we want to make a video for you i was like make a video to this like can you make <laughs> and, uh, and so it was cool it's just like you know now like i like i had to unfollow little b on twitter because it's just so much like He's like constantly retweeting underage like, yeah. girl, half naked girls. I was like, yo, this is fucked up. And I, yeah, I had that's actually, weird. I had actually hit him up a while ago and was like, yo, dude, there's all these like white supremacists talking about bass now. Like all these like based white supremacists. And like they're all like they're using your language, man. Like you got to fucking say something about this shit because you can't have Nazis naming themselves after you, dude. Yeah. Like, that's fucked up. No, it's not good at all, man. We fucking hate that shit. Wow. I mean, long story short, I never would have ever guessed that if I had to pick a main or like a hip hop artist from Maine who worked with Lil B, I'm not a, I not I you would probably be one of the last ones I would have picked, to be honest, man. So I love, I just love seeing things like that. You have a lot of interesting um, pieces of your history. And um, I think one of the biggest ones that I really noticed was um you did some pretty impactful shit when you moved to denver what or when and what made you want to move to denver originally um you know what can do you edit this um 
I can. No. Yeah, no, I tend not to edit it. No, though. All right, I'm pissed, but it's cool. I'll wait. Um, yeah. uh, can I piss real quick? Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what I'll do is, I'll just break down and talk to the camera right now. I'll give a little summary, little wrap up. Go take a quick bathroom break. All right, Albert. How we doing today? We're taking a little intermission to say this podcast is sponsored by Yardy Ting. If you want some Jamaican barbecue, if you want something that's off the beaten path, let's be honest. You grew up in Maine. A lot of it's bologna sandwiches, a lot of it's spaghetti, a lot of it's macaroni and cheese in the house growing up. We're not the most uh, diverse food culture out here. We got some good stuff, don't get me wrong. But, you know, a lot of times you grew up eating PB&J. Yardy Ting is going to change that. You go to Yardy Ting, they're going to open up your palate to mad flavors you never had before. Check out Yardy Ting. It's in the public market house in Portland, Maine. Support black business and get some damn good food while you're at it. And uh, also shout out Fire on Four, Beach Boys, High Roller, and Crow's Nest. If you need lobster rolls, you need a haircut, you need cannabis, we got you. And Saul is back, I think. Good to go. Hey, sorry about that. I just, sometimes my schedule's all thrown off this morning. I had my burrito right before we talked. So it just, like, slowed down my coffee and liquid. What kind schedule. of burrito? Just tofu, man. Just tofu nice. with asparagus. It, the five minute... Uh, whatever frozen Trader Joe's vegetables are in the freezer. Hell yeah. I love tra Trader Joe's because it's just so easy and they don't put as much fake shit in it. So I like it, man. You got the garlic aioli. Oh, I was thinking like, if I'm thinking tofu, I always put hot sauce on tofu to give a little spice, but that's just me. Um, got it. it doesn't taste like anything if you yeah, don't. That's true. <laughs> it tastes like <laughs> just like neutral, zero. But anyway... So, so Denver, so Denver, back. so what's, what's, what's the, what's the Denver was, was the question about what made you want to move there? And when did you move there? Um, Denver was basically like a Flagstaff upgrade. We got bored and Flagstaff felt like we wanted to get back to civilization. So we moved to Denver, which is to me, basically a bigger Flagstaff. Um, you know, when we're like looking at a place, we're always like seeing what the vegan food is like when we go there. And so we like, you know, me and my wife drove to Denver, had a couple meals. It was either going to be Chicago or Denver. And uh, luckily, we ended up in Denver. Um, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> and yeah, I just fucking loved it there. I still do. I, I, I uh, love Denver. Um, how, how many or like what years did you live there specifically? 2009 through 2018. Oh, wow. So, so like, you started the Soulcast there. Yep. Yeah. No shit. It, yeah. And uh, yeah, so we, yeah, so, we, you know, I, again, it was just right timing kind of thing. We moved to Denver, you know, right when um, you, I could, I rented a house downtown Denver, three blocks, four blocks from the Capitol, I think for like a three bedroom house with a yard, big yard for like 900 bucks a month. Um, like, you know, Jeez, and, that's cheap and, as fuck. Yeah. We ended up like buying that house and, flipping it um but yeah you know and that so it was awesome we were like living downtown able to like walk and get all this crazy food riding bikes around it was dreamy man and uh that sounds then, surreal yeah and like right up the street from me was this thing called denver open media and my homie ravi did a lot of stuff there and so like they knew me over there and so they um they offered me a job kind of doing like tech intern stuff. And that's when like the Anacon stuff was really bad. I was like, I had no money. So I had to work. Um, and I was like, as I was like getting ready to like start this career, I really didn't want to do. I was like, that's when I had like the break. I was like, no, I'm fucking writing a cease and desist. I'm taking all of my shit back from Anacon. I'm not going to work if i don't have to um, yeah but um yeah and so i was like working there and like we were doing like the free speech tv and like just like in that mix of like like all this like cool non-profit documentary stuff that was happening mm -hmm. over there and then um so you like started to like know people in that world and then like um occupy popped off yeah and i want, I want uh, to talk about that like how, how did you get it because you obviously you know have been in some um you in Europe at least like your mind opened up to different ideologies and political theories and then you even at the time in what Oakland were studying political science so this is stuff that you've been interested in right but it sounds like it really kind of came fully together in Denver right yeah I mean 
you know, the only sh- the only stuff I even read when I was a kid was like Black Panthers, Malcolm X kind of shit. Like, I, did you play like Public Enemy at all shit. growing up and shit like yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, Public Enemy was, you know, it's I did what everybody else did. You started with the Fat Boys, then you go to like the Eric B and Rakim, Master Ace kind of stuff, and then Master it's like pub, pub, Public Enemy, KRS One, X Clan. Yep. Then it's gangster yeah. rap and poor and righteous teachers. It. Did you like Wise Intelligent and shit like that too? All that stuff. Yeah. All that yeah. Stuff. Sweet. But back um, to back to Denver, though. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, basically, I've been like reading and researching and like, you know, really ever since 9-11, I started reading. I started really trying to understand why things were happening, why things were the way they were. Like, how do you change the world? Kind of big questions. Yeah. How do you, how do you really affect change? Um, <clears throat> and yeah. And so then when Denver came, you know, I was like moved to denver i was like watching occupy wall street online uh i think like before that i was like really like my music i started making these like really politicized hip-hop mixtapes called nuclear winter where i'd like remix yeah. like famous songs and like turn them anti-capitalist and like so i was like experimenting with like using the internet um remix culture as like a platform for like political ideas and like how i can like experiment with my music to like actually engage with what's going on and like with some success um maybe some stuff kind of maybe looks corny in uh hindsight or whatever um but you know you experiment you try things yeah you gotta shit pops sometimes yeah see what sticks on the wall right that's what they say you throw shit on the wall and see what sticks (laughs) for real for real and then um yeah and then like you know i was like watching occupy wall street new york shit happening like and i just remember just watching like people thousands of people just being arrested on this bridge in like live stream and i was like i remember i was watching it i was like i was like dude people are you know finally in our generation they're finally fighting back like i gotta get out there and so i like you know i think i like hopped online and started tweeting at like my friend uh johnny five from the flow bots i was like man we gotta go occupy denver let's go yeah and uh and then like i go oh, down well, like, there like handlebars flow bots like that like yeah. group? no shit wow i don't know you you're connected out here so I'll look at you but anyway keep going <laughs> they're my they're i did i did a lot of stuff with those guys out there that's um, like they yeah. were they were huge for a minute like flow bots were everywhere summer 2008 i remember they they, they didn't disappear that yeah. summer at least <laughs> i mean in denver they're like a cultural staple they are they do a lot of really cool that's cool sick. stuff in denver um love them. but yeah they're, they're organizers you know um and uh yeah and so we, i was like we'll go down there and then it was just like it was a shit show you know just like every occupy was just like just a, a shit show um and but like you know being a touring musician somebody who'd like had to like learn how to do my own pr like that that's how what like like after i left anticon i survived by becoming my own like pr operation and so when i got to occupy i was like oh shit they need people who can help write communiques and press releases they need people who can like help work press i actually know all the local press i know global Whoa. national i know people all over the world yeah. and i have like connections to a number of uh you know a bunch of people like my music you know i'd made a lot of connections through my music and so a lot of like pretty pretty i don't know famous much more famous than me like journalists and activist types like fuck with my music and so it like so i have like credibility i get trust where a lot of people in the radical world don't you know because it's like i know so many people and they they know they can trust me because i have a track record i've been around 30 years it's not like i'm not a cop yeah you know, it's not a gimmick either you're not like hey like i need a cool soundbite for an album run or an al- <laughs> album promo run um oh i think my gopro is gonna die hold up let me switch my camera real quick yeah yeah Screw. or uh or oh i need a uh let's take a photo let's take a quick selfie on this riot line like no <laughs> let's go give a co- oh, let's go give a riot police a pepsi <laughs> <laughs> give him a hug um <laughs> Yeah. And then, so I just started doing all that shit and then like, you know, just getting my confidence up, you know, brushing up against riot police and just, yeah. Um, Can you talk like, well, were there any, like, 
because that's a huge like we could probably do a whole podcast on your time with the Occupy Denver movement but like what sticks out to you memories wise were those some like big moments where you're like I'm out here doing this or like oh shit this is intense or anything like that I mean there were time. I mean there were I mean there's so much I could say about that and I mean really a lot of the a lot of the best stuff wasn't occupy related it was stuff that we did many years in the future that kind of started there but i remember there was one night where there was just like five thousand of us just rampaging through the streets and i was just like yeah we could do anything you know um and you know like you know times when like we make it onto the highway and just shut it down or like to feel when you feel that power of thousands or hundreds or just a determined group of people who don't give a fuck it won't back down and you can see the cops are fucking scared um or the cops don't have the power to that's do the it. biggest thing for me not to interrupt but like it's just letting people remember what the fuck is going on like you're much more of i think a political theorist you know um than i am i don't even really know if i have like a term to call myself like what i view but I just want people to understand that this is a country for the people, by the people. Like, it's what we've been taught when we were fucking indoctrinized in our little history classes. So fight for that shit, because it's going to get taken away if you don't. Like, literally, like, you have to you have to do what you kind of do, man, and what you did in Denver to make people remember we have power. Sorry to interrupt, but I just yeah. think it's so important to remember that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I think there are a lot of people who would say, like, it's actually not for the people and by the people. It's for the rich. You know, I mean, if the coronavirus has really shown us anything, it's that like they're going to basically do what they can to like find the proper balance between like the the, the acceptable amount of people dying and suffering yeah. versus like how much is this going to boil over and people start rioting again, like yeah. George Floyd versus like what's good for the economy versus like what's good for everybody. Like they don't give a fuck. They don't give a fuck about us. They That's don't true. give a fuck about us. like You're you look correct. at Texas, Texas right now, like it's only getting worse, man. It's, it's only bad. gonna get fucking worse. And now you have someone Biden promising all this shit. And then now he gets in and now he's telling us why we can't do that. Okay, yeah. okay now we can't do this. We can't. And um, yeah, and so it's like I believe that you know the only way we get like changes and shit are when we go out there and like do those things ourselves like the black Panthers did, opening thousand up percent. opening up health clinics opening up food infrastructure like doing things that like so we don't need the government we don't need police we don't mm-hmm. need we don't need insurance black panthers like, police their own communities and kept their communities safe from police but then fbi doesn't like that so what does the fbi fucking do nixon's america calls the black panthers like what a terrorist group a hate group and literally they're keeping their communities safe from tax paid institutions that are supposed to keep communities safe i mean right. I'm, pre- I'm preaching to the choir here when i'm right. talking to soul about this shit but just so the listeners at home get what we're talking about um but then but then that's where your breakfast uh that's where your school breakfast program comes from is from heels like, on wheels they, and they, shit like that they saw the black panthers doing that shit and they were like oh no 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 we have to step in and do this if if it's giving them power, then no, 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 we need to take that away. We need to, we need to provide. Dude, that. Fred Hampton, man. Fred Hampton's what, 21 years old when he gets assassinated by the FBI? Like, crazy, like I can't even watch that movie out of love for Fred Hampton that they just made because I'm like, I know it's probably a good movie, but like, you got this like capitalistic movie studio making a movie about Fred Hampton's life. And this motherfucker literally put his entire life on the line. Like, he knew he was going to die. He was set six years younger than I am now, and he inspired the movement that changes the, I think changes the world. And Fred Hampton, I still think is one of the most empowered, empowering American figures ever. And so I just think about like real, like I hate the words like real change, but like Fred Hampton is that shit. Black Panther party is that shit. And um, to get back to you, like I think it's just so important that we remember that change will only occur when the people stand up and take it from the, yeah. those who have power. Yeah, or you make it impossible for them to do their shit, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's all the kinds of subtle things that go along with that. It's like, you know, to me, what's important about Occupy is like people connecting and people finding each other. And so the people, the relationships that I made in the streets then, you know, culminated in like bigger things down the road or relationships that allowed for 
communication to happen a certain yeah. way so that like groups that maybe don't get along so well can like collaborate even though they're like political analysis are different and shit and, like some people mm. like some people are strictly nonviolent. some people have a more nuanced view of what violence is and, <laughs> and self-defense uh, man if a system is beating you down are you being violent if you defend yourself no right i mean but you know then it's like then it's like everything that's happened in the streets since um george floyd exceeds anything i saw like the amount of like denver cops that got put in the hospital and like cop cars that got torched and shit like that the, just the amount of fire like we never saw stuff like that yeah cool shit popped was, off this summer I mean, the last summer heavy even in portland like i came down to portland and, like most of most of the shit was like a like parades and shit um but the i heard people were even looting um downtown portland at um what's that store urban outfitters yeah yeah so I, uh what do i want to say i gotta be careful when i'm on camera all right yeah i was um I live in Portland, so I've been like been around during all this. Um, I wasn't there like the night all this shit happened, but um, allegedly people were like spray painting shit, and then someone like like punched, like broke the Urban Outfitters door and took some clothes. Real fucking small shit. Like awesome, everyone, no. I, yeah, I mean, straight, I'm not gonna say anything, but yeah, I mean, I'm smiling. <laughs> that's 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 what I'm saying. So I just think it's so tough for people with privilege who live in these fucking bubbles to understand the sheer travesty of what has gone on to, for people in this nation and if you're more upset about a couple shitty pairs of jeans getting stolen from a corporation than you are about systemic racism oppression and just all the top down horrible shit that's occurred to people in this country then you got your priorities fucked up that's just my opinion like if you care more about damage to property than damage to humans what are you doing that's just me though I don't, I think people got their priorities fucked up, but you probably think the same. You're smiling. So, um, of course, man. <laughs> tremendous. Well, I'm getting off topic. I'm getting too excited here. So, um, I just wanted to say I respect the fuck, um, out of what you did in Denver, just because it's so important for people to remember that, like you said, this country really isn't for the people. But when I was taught about American history and the Constitution when I was like 10, I thought it was. So, I think, you know, I love them. I see people fight for shit that maybe we take for granted in a sense and then even so with the podcast um that you started in denver i think you really you just deserve to get some flowers in a sense i, I like giving people the flowers so they can smell them so i appreciate you uh using your voice and because you could just you know you could maybe sit around click some royalty checks live a simple life get like a cushy job with some network connections you have but you're out here using your voice and i think that's just mad important and Respect. I don't know. I don't know if I could get a cushy, cushy job. Work, <laughs> I, I think I would take it right now. Okay. Well, you, would you stop doing the soul, would you stop doing the soulcast or the, uh, the new podcast? I should say. No, I mean I wouldn't stop doing any. I I do what I do because I enjoy doing it. You know. Tremendous bottom man. Line, uh, bottom line, I do what I do because I enjoy doing it. But you know, like I like Maine College of Arts uh was hiring a podcasting instructor part-time and i applied for the job i was like yeah. i don't have a degree but i bet i'm more qualified than anyone you would be bringing I in here i think so man and but they didn't you know they didn't hit me up so i was like all right cool i, I don't really i'm not dying to work but i thought yeah. that would have been that that would have been fun i would have like um just because like honestly like um i spend a lot of time indoors and it's like the my organizing isn't in the past um i you know, I know some people out here. I don't know a lot of people out here. And when you move to a place and then there's a pandemic and you have like two baby, uh, two toddlers, it's like difficult to like be running around in the streets the same way. Yeah. Um, but my, my organizing days are not done. I, I intend to, um, once this pandemic lifts, uh, do what I can to get my hands uh, in the fight here as well. I'm not, uh, I haven't, I haven't receded from the, the, st the eternal struggle with the state and capital and the civilization itself. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I am still at war. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that. Um, sweet. Yo, well, I want to get into Maine more. I want to like talk about your time here, but before we do, like, again, I think Denver was a pretty monumental time period for you. I think not only was it, you know, a place where you started some 
things that you're doing now that are pretty important and impactful. It was a, if I may say, just talking to you, it seemed like a pretty transitional time, you know, like you figured out your departure from Anticon, you have um, other musical endeavors, Fake Four Inc., for instance, like you can start putting out stuff with them if you want. When did you start um, actually, it's kind of off topic, but you have what, Black Box Tapes and Black Canyon? Are those your? Um... They're not real. I mean, I actually, yeah, yeah. I just started Black Can- I mean, they're not real labels. They're just but like. That's how you, it's your imprint though, right? They're just accounts with one account is with Revolver and the other account is with <laughs> Alpha Pup. And that's the only places those words appear. They're not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the, those revolver is a distributor alpha pup is a different distributor um i mean black box tapes was my attempt to relaunch a record label i always told myself if i built a model a business model for myself that worked um that i, I felt like i could do something for other people i would try and so i started black box tapes as a label i want to say in like 2014 because mm-hmm. we were also doing like a, a monthly uh, experimental electronic night and so i was like trying to start a record label that was like fusing radical politics with like multi-genre hip-hop shit um ambient stuff like just anything i yeah. was into that sort of had like a similar ideology some kind of thing that you could trace from record to record and um really quickly i learned that that was a mistake i hated every aspect of it i hated (laughs) i hated communicating with artists and like explaining to them why their record wasn't in pitchfork and like just all that shit just um just sucks it just sucked because it's like oh here's your 300 hundred dollar check you sold all your you sold all your tapes here's your 300 hundred dollar check it's like you know what am i like what so i just stopped i was like fuck i'm not putting out any more buddy else's shit i'm not really helping anyone yeah it's way too much work and then i just had a kid so you know when you have kids your time becomes a little more scarce i can imagine you really can't until you have a kid and or kids uh maybe you can because you maybe you're friends with kids or yeah just i've like not or shit do i have any like close close friends that have kids no like best friends who's like um siblings have kids and shit and i can just see like you have four kids and negative free time like you have no you have no free time like you're taking away from free time 20 years in the future right now yeah uh, <laughs> yeah i always i always was like oh man people who have kids you have kids and you're dead inside you know and it's like yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i imagine hopefully the kid gives you some uh some sort of it's not just like this child is killing me it's like there's got to be some moments of it's the best man. <laughs> yeah it's the best yeah, it's the best go. i love it i love every yeah. second of it but uh but you just are tired and, and you don't have as much time um so every i have to like be really efficient with my time which yeah. is something i don't like to do because i like to just feel the day and, yeah well uh, if i may then just we gotta be aware of time management time management is one of my like my big things in life too um <laughs> I want to talk about the starting of the soul cast and then kind of like maybe moving to Maine. But before we do, is there anything you want to just say about your time living um, and organizing and being an activist in Denver before we move on? Yeah. I mean, it really does hold a very special place in my heart. It, it actually like transformed me. You know, we were talking about, uh, I was talking about how, you know, being famous really young, made me not trust people, but then when like, you know, and so I'd been like soul all along. And so when we got done to Occupy Denver, I wasn't soul. I was Tim and no one knew who I was. You know, there were a few people who did, but didn't say anything. Um, cool. And, and so no one knew who I was. And so everything, all the, so all the social capital, all the clout, however you want to put all the connections and like work yeah. I did was based on like, you did this work, you made this happen. You don't give a fuck. You're, crazy this is awesome like um and so those connections um kind of like it changed the wiring in my head where i didn't like i wasn't like soul 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 all the time i was like tim and that um that sort of like kind of started to clear some bullshit cobwebs out of my head where nice. like where i was too caught up in my identity as soul um mm. so i started to like allow a little space for myself to be i guess um someone else and that was uh that was cool and so you know all those i uh yeah it's i mean you know how it is in the fucking pandemic you spend so much time 
alone in the house, I just am constantly revisiting periods. From yeah, there. I get I'm so like, many oh, me- so memories nice. just like hit me. I'm like, oh shit, like I forgot about that. That was a, that was a time. Uh, so I, I can yeah. resonate with that. That's yeah, cool yeah. though. I'm glad. And I, I I like that you said um it allowed you to be Tim because one really important thing for me that I tell myself is my name is Ben Panette, but you know, my media name is Benny P, but I can't be Benny P unless I take care of Ben Panette. Like if I, if Ben Panette doesn't eat breakfast, have a glass of water, clear his head, write out what's on his mind. I can't be doing this with you. So I can't be Benny P right now. So I resonate with that heavy. Um, Let's then talk about something very close to home podcasting. When did you, or what made you want to start the soul cast when you were out there? Um, when I was working at Denver Open Media, they wanted me to do a uh, public access show about philosophy. And uh, so we had like, you know, all the, we were like getting ready to do it. And then I was like, I just don't really want to be on camera. I don't really want to be producing video content. And then at a certain point, I was like, I don't even need to come over here to do this. I can just do this from my house. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's just what I decided to do. I just, uh, stuff that I was geeking out on, authors that I liked, I just started contacting them. And then people started accepting. And I was like, cool. Um, Sweet. And so it's basically like, you know, I, from the beginning of it, I was like, like, um, imagining myself as like the student who gets to like pull the professor aside for a couple hours and ask them like your deepest questions about the subjects that they're writing about. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah. But just doing that shit has really educated me a lot because I'm just constantly, it's like being in college or something. I'm just constantly engaging with these works and thinking about it and having these conversations and, uh, and people fuck with it and it's cool. And yeah. It's fun. A very successful podcast i'd say i think it's probably looking at all the I mean, dope shit you put out in your career i think the soul cast would have to be like a pretty high bullet on that for impactful things you put out yeah i think so i think that there's really um i get a lot of people reaching out to me about the podcast mm-hmm. um uh probably more than music at this point so yeah you know, it is what it is that's cool though um I'm going to talk more about the podcast in just a couple minutes here. But one question I want to ask now, when did you move back to Maine and what made you want to move back here? Um, Around 2018. um, You know, we had a kid in like 2017, Winston, our first, and we were living, you know, our house, we had bought our house in 2000, I don't know, 2015, maybe the downtown Uh, Denver one. Yeah, like our landlord, like we just kept saying, like, don't fix this house up. Don't do any, don't do anything to it. We'll, we will buy it from you. And then like bullshitting, you know, and then like, he was like, okay, we're getting ready to sell. I was like, do you want it? And I was like, yeah. And then, so we qualified for a loan. And so we bought the house um, and it was, you know, we got it really cheap at the time, right before Denver went crazy. Yeah. It's expensive out there. I've heard these days. Yep. That's like right before the, the legal recreational cannabis boom. It was, right, it was right before that. Um, and so right when, you know, which was fucking crazy to be able to like walk a block and buy weed. Legally. It's tremendous. It's just insane. I work um, in cannabis out here in Maine and I, it's, it's a dream every day, man. I'm like, what is life now? Like, I can't, I can't believe this shit. Anyway. It's awesome. <laughs> um, it's awesome. And uh, I know the other day I found like a vintage, vape um before they banned the flavored vapes i found like a vintage one in my couch seat a full one the other day i was like like, oh yeah baby 2018 (laughs) (laughs) that shit doesn't really go bad either man straight like liquid thc (laughs) so i found out um but yeah and so um so yeah so i um yeah so we had a kid and i was just like you know what like uh it was a number of things like gentrification had gotten so crazy in denver that almost all my friends had gotten pushed out so all the organizing all the things that i that i felt like the community i felt was like dissipating and like my crew was all like hating it there it was like we're all getting out of here we're fucking Mm. getting out of here and like at the same time i was like going for i was in gotten really into permaculture and so we had like a little food forest in our house in denver and like a little pond and like just really getting into like land and growing food and was limited with what i could grow in such a small place but also like it's hard to grow fruit trees and shit in the high desert because you know the the 
uh, it'll, you'll get 70 degrees in February, your trees will blossom out and then it'll snow and kill everything. And so you can have, you can get snow in September, you can get snow in, in June, you know what I mean? In like Maine, because of the ocean, the weather's more stable. Um, it it doesn't have those wild swings. I mean, it's still fucking, we're still going to get the fucking global warming fuck everything shit but yeah it's uh it's, it's a little more <laughs> but it was like it was that it was like wanting to have a little more land like my sister moved out here she bought a farm out in the sebago area and it's just what she got for what she paid was just crazy you know and she lives on a pond and it's just Ooh. insane i'm like dude i this is what i want i want to i want to i don't want to see cranes when i look out my window and mm. um and you know i mean there's a lot of shit i mean like I think that global warming is real <laughs> and, uh, and I don't want to be in the high desert. I don't want to be like, like I felt like the ground I was standing on wasn't stable at the time. And I wanted to like move to more stable ground. And so yeah. we were struggling with kid with one kid. And I was like, you know what? I can move back home. I can have the support of my family. We can, you know, grow food. We can have a more holistic life. We can give our kids, maybe we'll have another kid. Um, and we did. Maybe we'll give our kids Congrats. the life. The thank you. The uh, life that um, that we want. You know. The and, and like and also live a life that we want, like an authentic, kind of homesteady kind of life. But like still having the trappings of a metropolitan. So like you know you can still go down to Portland and people still look cool. Like they're from the <laughs> shit. You can still like you know what I mean. You can still get like like shout out to the Szechuan spot in Portland. I just can't eat that food enough. Oh, Szechuan um, chicken that or, 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 or a Szechuan kitchen on Congress. Yeah. yeah. Forget about it, bro. What's that? They have one. I got to look it up. So it's called Sichuan kitchen. I think Sichuan. Fucking a. If that, that place, literally, I don't know if we would have moved here if we hadn't, uh, Sichuan. we were like going to go in the green elephant. We went in the Szechuan kitchen. I was like, this place is. Yeah. Cause you're up. vegan, right? Yeah. Yeah, and um, Green Elephant's all vegan too, but Sichuan Kitchen, you know, so I, I eat um, a good amount of poultry. That's like my meat that I try and focus on. I don't, I'm not a big beef and pork guy, but I still eat meat um, regardless. Hey, n- nobody's perfect. Thank you, man. I, I uh, dude, they have this chicken dish there. Oh, God, I'm looking at the menu right now. I don't know. Oh, my God, the smoky tofu salad. That looks crazy. The mushroom salad. I got to get off this. Never mind. That I can't place look- is fucking good, man. I can't look at Mapo Chinese food. tofu there. Just the, the Szechuan peppers. But anyway, yeah, so it was like all that. And it was also like. I'm hungry. Also, basically, we found a, a farmhouse in Brunswick that we could afford. And we were able to basically sell our house in Denver and have enough money left over from. Um the sale of the sale of the house to buy a, a farm outright and so now we don't we was like oh we're mortgage free at age 40 like not bad for, with land with farmland that's huge yeah i mean it's i wouldn't say it's farmland it's most it's it's like pretty overrun and wild and there's a lot of work but yeah to have like an acre and a half um you know like for me like all i want is like to just be stable like i don't give a shit about fame or fortune or any of that shit like if i can just like i'm good i i have i have my property i got a house i can like grow food i can like you know we're tapping maple trees right now like syrup season man yeah it's awesome so it seems like you're enjoying living in maine then yeah yeah i love it i mean you i wish i um i wish i'd had like a better social network set up before the pan which i had like another six months to like hang out before yeah. the pandemic yeah. hit because it was like right when i started to have like a lot of good friends the pandemic hit and then everybody was just locked inside for the most part that's true it's Damn. like a lot of people don't even want to get together you know yeah it's fair i mean it is a pandemic it's it's tough though i mean luckily um i'm hoping that 2021 will play out at least with COVID 19 i don't know if we'll get another pandemic eventually but i'm hoping that you know with just everyone having a year under their belt this summer will be a little bit more manageable, but we'll find out when we get there, I guess, you know, but um, it's cool. I'm glad that you're in Maine, man. I'm glad that you're back in your area, your home state. And um, I want to focus on some recent endeavors. I definitely want to talk about um, the Institute for Post-American Studies and um, MBFX for sure. But I just want to say one more quick thing I respect about you too. I mentioned that I I like that you use your voice because I think it's important that we do that. But 
I, I just I like that um, you're very dedicated to like independence, especially in a uh, like a food sense, like foraging, farming, permaculture. Um, that shit to me, I think, is long term, like a skill that most, if not everyone should have if they really want to survive, because I don't know if the infrastructure, if the food systems, even if the economic structures of this country decades long will continue to be what it is now. And I think a lot of people just eat you know, or spoon fed, whatever's given to them. And, you know, I think it's huge to have a better understanding of just how to grow your own food, nutrition. That's something that saved, you know, my mental health in the recent years, just taking, you know, big consideration what I eat. I see you shouting out elderberries and things like that. So um, I guess, is there anything you just want to say about this whole, um, you know, really independent kind of driven, like, mentality you have about food culture is is that something that you know i'm hitting on the head in a sense yeah i mean you know um i think it's i've never really thought about its relationship to other things in my life um you know uh but i guess i would just say is that like you know i'm, I'm coming from the perspective of like a doom of, from two perspectives one is like a gourmet vegan who has been poor my whole life and has always eaten like a rich person does like better than most restaurants. And like, you know, I just love to eat good food. It's like, I love to cook food for friends. I like to break bread with friends, like food, you know, when you're a vegan, your life is centered around food. And so it's like, on one hand, I just want to eat good food. I want to share good food. Like that's what moves my soul. Like when I, when I go on tour, what I remember mostly is how much money I made and what I ate. You know yeah, what I mean? like in what city? Like this city had that amazing vegan chicken yeah. wings, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, yeah, and like, and then you learn just so much about cooking and food, just going around. And so it's like, on one perspective, it's just a purely hedonistic thing. Like, I just it's like pleasure based. Yeah, I like to, I like to eat, and I like to eat with others. Um, I like to share, and you know, I like to host, and you know, mm. uh, so there's one aspect of it. Mm. And the other aspect of it is that, like, I don't think this world is 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 stable you know um the writing on the wall is that shit is going to hit the fan so it's like the number one thing that we can do to not fucking die is grow our own food in the immediate like if you believe that capital that we're living through a collapse and a fragmentation of our society like civil war kind of shit if you really think that we're living through a collapse that like we're in a crumbling empire and we are um then it only goes to reason that things that we need to survive are going to get more and more challenging as this country looks resource wars seem to be a reality in the near future i hate to say that but that's but that's what my gut tells me man yeah i mean i don't i I mean like water is scarce you know when you look when you think about people in texas being overcharged 100 and whatever 13 billion dollars overcharges because the corporations are allowed to just give them a $15,000 electric bill for a week of, for a storm. I mean, that is fucking insane. That's the kind of shit that you hear happening in places like Bolivia before there's a revolution. Um, Yeah. And so, you know, you have all these things happening at once. You have climate change, you have all the fucking instabilities, you have the pandemic, you have police killings causing uprisings, you have white supremacists organizing, you have and then all the insane right wing conspiracy stuff. That's like a really dangerous force in our society. Yeah. It's like, if you're, if you're acting on false information and willing to die for it, like propaganda and misinformation are huge parts of yeah. uh, building fascist control. Yeah. So, as, so as anyway, so, so anyway, if you think, so it's like, if, if I think that this world is not in, not in a trajectory for success then like yeah. i want to plant things that yeah back to like, farming yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i want to like like i want to know how to grow chestnuts chestnuts are a crop that can feed everyone like you know a, a couple chestnut trees you can turn that into a starch and a flour and make bread and you know learning to cook with what's around learning learning to cook with acorns has been fucking dope out here like Whoa. like like people ate acorns for 100,000 years and acorn flour tastes better than almond flour or any other nut flour i've ever had it's sweet um it, it has a texture like bread like you can make amazing bread and pancakes out of like, acorns no shit fucking, dude it's crazy man and i wouldn't have believed it until i like started doing it and uh like you can just go out pick a bunch of acorns 
so we, we have a podcast on it go listen to it i will Soak them. Damn. you can make acorn cheese acorn pancakes acorn muffins like it's amazing the and, more you uh, know I, and it's like that stuff that's all around us so like learning like how do we harvest i mean shit if i wasn't vegan i'd be a fishing motherfucker out here, <laughs> sure. um, but it's like yeah so it's like how do we like in the meantime like how do i how can i feed my family um if the shit goes down like this oh. whole time the whole pandemic i've had a greenhouse full of vegetables i've had cold frames full of salad greens and like i just left them there like all right well if like you know if things get worse we can eat this you know sure. um and so it's like and it's just fun i mean it's like part of like getting getting back to who we are like i said human beings ate acorns for a hundred thousand years yet you and i you know, we've sang about chestnuts on an open fire, but when have you ever had chestnuts on an open Not fire? ever. I eat you walnuts. Know? That's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm saying. And so it's like, um, yeah, I just think like, generally speaking for poor working class people, if you want to have a high quality of life, uh, grow your own food. I mean, just, just growing tomatoes and herbs and having a few fruit trees goes a long way. Um, mm. But it's like, you know, going beyond that and wanting to learn how to create like, whole ecosystems of like food forests that like can provide food year round. Um, there's a model by the guy I do the podcast with um, in Portland that a lot of people don't know about it. It's called um, Mount Joy. Do you know about Mount Joy? Mm -mm. <clears throat> you know, on the prom, the Eastern prom, there's this huge food forest. It's a free, yeah. free public orchard and anyone can go there and pick apples nuts I didn't um, know that. there's perennial vegetables there like turkish rocket sorrel um, onions and like anybody can go like my aaron and his friends built that and it's just a free orchard of just modeling all the stuff we're talking about and it's like any like you can go if you're if you're like i'm fucking broke this week i don't have any food you can go down to mount joy orchard guarantee you you can uh forage a a meal up there that is wild <laughs> and so it's like build imagine building like parks that replaced grocery stores and shit you know um it's you it sounds crazy but it's like that's that's how i look at it i look Dude, at it like what's more we... crazy though not to interrupt but like what's more crazy humans using land and nature that have been here forever to continue um our survival through you know, farming practices and foraging practices, like from a direct source, like from nature, we've lived here forever. Is that crazier than going to the store and getting a bag of Doritos that has more flavor in the entire bag than an entire New England village would eat in a hundred years back in the 1500s? <laughs> no, like it's, it's our, like we, we come from dirt. We come from grass. We come from nature. I love Doritos. I love my headphones. I love all this human shit we got but like we're more animal than we are human and i think people got to remember that like my fight or flight shit controls my entire life like a lot of my you know perceptions are based on the emotions i feel due to my fight or flight responses that's all nature man so yeah i'm yeah, big i'm big on nature i'm big on going back to that all right, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get <laughs> i think we've been talking for like two hours so, so oh my I god i want to make sure oh, i really? keep on yeah it's been a minute man okay um I want to make sure I get to more topics before I. Sorry, I haven't talked to anyone in a week. It's been a while. No. It's been a while. <laughs> um, no, it's cool though. Just farming rant over. I love to see people um, again talking about the importance of sustainability, especially when it comes to your own food. So respect to that. It's and um, when this is all over, I'd love to come up and maybe gift you a bottle of something, and then we could have a. A nice home cooked soul meal, but that's in a different future. <laughs> hey, hey, anytime, man. Anytime. Hell yeah. Um, well, let's focus now on some recent things. Um, what made you want to switch from or rebrand, as much as I don't love that word, but you had the Soul Cast, a very popular podcast. And just recently, you've rebranded it as the Institute for Post American Studies, correct? Yeah. yeah. And I think, I mean, basically it was like a joke album title. I was like saying to pain one, but it was like an idea that kept popping up in my head is like, I feel like that's what I'm really doing is the Institute for posting, even though it's like pretentious and kind of, <laughs> yeah. I feel like what I'm really, what I'm really talking and thinking about is like how to like collapse and we live in a fragmented failed state. And so how do we, 
what does it mean to live and fight? You know, what does it mean to really dedicate your life to um, struggle and resistance? And, uh, you know, you can't just keep running around in the streets doing the same shit, the same petty activism. And so that's kind of where I've arrived. And so it's mostly thinking about like infrastructure and autonomy. And like, um, I think with the soul cast, it's been a journey where I just like, because it's the soul cast, whatever soul likes. So it's like, you know, originally I just wanted to interview people like bus driver and shit, like rappers I knew who I thought were really smart, who never had a chance to really talk about what was going on with their work. Yeah. Um, when you listen, when you would read interviews back in like the early 2010s, 2000s, like the interviews are stupid. People don't ask questions like you're asking me. People ask you, what's your top 10 record? Like just shit. No one gives a fuck. If you were to make a diss track against Drake, what would you say, soul? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like just stupid shit. And so it's like, I don't want, um, I, so anyway, I just kept doing the soul cast, just asking people like the, the things that I thought, like the conversations I would have with artists yeah. backstage or when we're hanging out or in the van, way more interesting than what I would read. And so it's like, I want to do that. So I want to talk to musicians and also authors. Yeah. And then I did that for a while. And then I started like dabbling in permaculture stuff. And, um, and I just, just kept doing whatever. And then like the permaculture stuff started to like really catch on and uh, the propaganda by the seed, which was like a subcast on the soul cast. And so I was like, I, I wanted it to be its own thing. Cause I think a lot of the people who like that shit might not be into an interview with fucking Chesky or whoever, like they're, yeah. they're, they're just there for the plants. And then I started to feel the same way about like the philosophy stuff. It's like a lot of the authors, like it's just a lot of that shit doesn't belong together. Uh, unless you're Tim Holland, unless you're like <laughs> really, unless you're in my fucking brain, yeah. you know what I mean? 100%. And so for the success of all these projects, I wanted to sort of like, it's kind of like a haymaker to see if like I can do bigger things with all of these things this year. Yeah. Um, as I'm like reevaluating my work, like I just had too much time in the pandemic to just think. And so that's what I arrived with at the end of the year is like yeah. propaganda by the seed is going to be its own thing. I'm going to, kill the soul cast and i'm gonna turn it into this other thing um because it's not like fake it till you make it but it's like walk in the direction you want to go i see myself doing public education infrastructure type work type projects mm. that's what i'm interested in mm. so by calling it the institute for post-american studies it's throwing a flag down and saying like this is uh this is what i'm gonna be doing for a little while now um i'm just going to be having conversations about what does it you know about autonomy and um revolutionary theory that's not so much based around like um revolution as like this fixed thing where we seize power but more of like a process of like um building building power and making state power obsolete pushing capitalism out of our lives and i mean those are the ideas i'm like toying with now mm. um and so yeah i just want to keep doing that and basically it's like um i feel like calling it the soul cast makes it seem like it's a vanity project and a lot of people i think um look at it that way and so i just wanted to hit reset on it and see if i could like uh do something different with it, it yeah. and also also to push myself it's like it's really easy if like i don't have a podcast episode this week to be like hmm i can just call so and so and have an awesome conversation and it's like i want to push myself a little bit more to like make just more like stronger content that's like more educational and concise yeah uh, this, because when i started doing it no one was really doing it and now there's like a hundred theory podcasts there's like yeah. so many everybody's got every every rapper has a podcast now and so it's like you got to always if you want to win you got to be ahead of the ball you can't be chasing the ball that's true you know, su success is all about who gets there first that's a good quote it's a great quote so hell yeah um sweet i think i've touched upon a lot of what i want to talk about the really biggest thing i really would like to still touch upon would be mbfx if you're down 
Um, however, one of my favorite parts of Benny's crib, the podcast, is uh, the rapid fire segment. It's kind of more of a lighthearted segment. You want to do some rapid fire questions right before we hit that? Sure. All right, let's do it. What's your favorite season? Fall. Favorite public enemy album? Fear of a Black Planet. Least favorite insect? <laughs> Deer ticks. I figured it was ticks. I hate ticks too much. I don't like that word hate, but I I, I do, hate ticks. I do not like ticks severely. <laughs> um, uh, favorite vegetable to farm? Kale. Who's an kale here? How much um do you eat kale? Do you eat kale consistently? All day. All day. I like kale chips a lot. That shit's good. I like kale and eggs. Oh, you don't eat eggs? Like, damn. No. Nope. My kid does. My kids do. Are your kids um vegetarian? Yeah. 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 We nice. just do. We we started giving them eggs because we had chickens before they Ooh. got eaten. Chickens and, eat uh, ticks, don't they? They're supposed to. Yeah, I think they ate a bunch of them before they got eaten. Well, everybody just playing their way in the role did the coyote come and kill your shit i don't know who got him i don't know i think it was a fox i think i think that fox is in, in my yard right now oh yeah you posted a picture of a fox bathing in the sun on your twitter recently right <laughs> yeah i'm like i'm like dying to like after this interview i'm gonna go inspect over there oh nice hell yeah well let's <laughs> let's, let's, let's get through it then um who is an mc that you want to give props to as a, as a rapper micah nine uh, you know in milo I gave props to Milo. Oh, Rap Ferreira? Yep. Yeah, Rap Ferreira is one of the best out of my yeah. opinion. Stupid. A lot of, I, he, he inspires me uh, more than anyone these days. Really? No mm-hmm. shit. I love to hear that. He's a very independent individual, too. Uh, he's, Rory? He's killing it. I mean, that, that guy's killing it. I love it. it. I you love it. it. Shout out the Ruby Yacht forever. All right. Who is a producer that you still want to work with? If any, I mean, shit, uh, factor televangel. I mean, a bunch of people, uh, famous producer. I would still work with premier uh, DJ, <laughs> DJ premier, dude. It'd still be cool <laughs> to get a primo track. Yo premier. I know you watching this. Probably not. I know you may be watching this. Get solid beat. Um, Actually evil D evil D evil D. All right. Um, what is it? This is a very, very big question. So whatever one comes to mind. When I say, what's a touring memory that sticks with you? Is there any that kind of just hit the back of your head immediately? Champagne bottle, empty champagne bottles uh, clinging against the back of the van. Which van? Any van. Any van. Oh, just like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like that. That's just a... rolling around in the back. That's tremendous. Um, what do you perceive as one of your greatest accomplishments? Uh, by I'm still fucking doing this shit 20 years later. Tremendous. I like that one a lot. Just being here is huge in itself, man. Yep. Um, last one. Stubbornness, dude. Stubbornness. That's the virtue. I'm too stubborn to get for you to get rid of me. I'm sticking around. <laughs> it's cool. I'm, I'm having fun. I like it, man. Um, last one. Uh, oh no, I just deleted it. Shit. Hold up, we Gucci. There we go. Last one. What's a goal you still have? To buy some land um, somewhere warm for winters because I'm not fucking fucking with this shit. Yeah, man. That's this is this cold winter, especially. It was tough, but we're out of it. Let's move on. Yeah, I've I've just been fantasizing about uh, you know, citrus, uh, citrus having like some place where i could do some winter farming yeah. somewhere warmer i think those orange cool. grows down in florida yeah. man dude full circle see them before they're gone before they're underwater i don't know? want to think about that i'm from old orchard beach man old orchard's going to be under underwater eventually so but let's stay in the present it's a beautiful sunny we call, march day we call uh we call old orchard beach french fry beach when right. anytime uh, my son wants to go to old orchard beach he get the pier fries it, he calls it french fry beach no worries you know i mean no no what no worries. No, no offense taken. <laughs> I don't even know what I was gonna say. I was gonna say no, no way was it because my um well you meant pier fries, right? That's what you were thinking about. Yeah, yeah. 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 My mother actually was married to the dude who owned pier fries back in the day. They divorced, but I could have eventually been a of 
Damn. French, and French fry fame. Now I'm doing this hip hop shit. The plants uh, in my apartment. Like I want French fries, man. Yeah, too bad. <laughs> Sweet. Well, you mom, some- mom fucked up. Yeah, come on. Or actually, no. I, 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 I would. I got so much love for my mom. <laughs> but um, so let's conclude this by talking about. Well, congratulations, you survived the rapid fire first off. But let's conclude this by talking about MBFX. It's the new album by Soul. Uh, I kind of trapped you into a two-hour interview to get you to this point, but I wanted to get Soul here because, like I said, I think you're one of the most just dopest to do it from the 207 man like you were out you know maybe ciphering and getting into fights on um, greater forest Ave here in portland 30 20 i don't even know how many years ago man 25 yep. 15 and you just travel the world you create one of the biggest you know independent hip-hop labels i think from the early millennium i'd say um just maybe independent labels and uh i don't know man just seeing what you do it's inspiring i'm, I'm here trying to do my shit i got my little podcast but you over here in Denver occupying bridges and highways and making a podcast, come back to Maine. You got a family life. You got the for uh, farming and foraging and you still making music. And I just love to see it. So there's your flowers while you can Thank see you. them. And um, let's talk about MBFX before we kind of wrap up here. Um, I like the album, yo. I, I thought it was very versatile sonically um, in terms of like the production and just the sounds I was hearing, but I like how consistent you are with just, your your lyrics your pen game you're very just i don't know like this is who i am this is what i believe you're going to listen to it and i don't give a fuck what you think that's kind of the vibe i get when i listen to your music yeah i mean i give a fuck what people think but i mean like basically um that i mean man's that's man's best friend man's best friend is like a touring cd side project i started doing around 2001 and it was like me just teaching myself how to make beats. And this is the last one, right? Not to interrupt, yeah. but this is the last one in the series. Yeah. And so it's like, I basically, I was making all this man's best friend shit. And like, I never wanted to make it be my big thing because the people around me, I always preferred the music that other people made. No Stom, Alias, um, whatever, DJ Payne one, whoever. I just like, when I make music over other people's shit, it just leads to music that people respond to better. Yeah. Generally speaking, the stuff that like, you know the stuff the sounds i'm drawn to are like these dark brooding kind of sounds that's the kind of music i make no matter how i try to mbfx tries to lighten it up at a few points but at the end of the day it's fire and brimstones that's how i process the world um and so very visceral (laughs) but i mean it's just it is just is what it is it's not trying to be I'm not trying to blow up off that shit. I don't have to blow up off that shit. I don't like you say, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Um, and I just want to make like music that I think is like quality. Um, mm. And um, yeah, so that record is like me beginning this new life. Um, this like poet in the woods, you know, um, this life um, and processing like what it means, like processing like what I've been through, what I've seen in Denver, like how I see the world, but then to see it from this vantage point that's somewhat removed in like a hinterland of of Maine on the fringes of like a college town and rural area, 20 minutes out of Portland. Like it's a, it's, it's a weird, um, it's just a weird place to be experiencing the world through um, yeah. compared to how I've lived in cities over the last few years. It's just, it's a interesting, you know, record. It's all made on like Ableton beats with like, you know, I use the SP 404. And you made all the beats, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and so it's like, it's cool if anybody likes it. I, there's a lot of songs I didn't put on it because I didn't like them, but um, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's the last in the chapter um, because it's like I feel like my production skills have like matured to a mm. certain point. But again, like with the pandemic, just having too much time to think about things, um, forcing myself to switch things up and try new things. I wanted to sort of bookend um, this period of soul of uh, man's best friend. And I'm going to keep doing other self-produced stuff. And oh, yeah. I, have a new, I have a new album with Pain One. Um, Ooh. That's about done. That's really good. The exclusive um, breaking news. 
I mean, I don't, I, I'm sure I've tweeted about it. <laughs> no, it's uh, mine. I want that. That's the, that's the Ryan okay. exclusive. <laughs> exclusive. Um, yeah, but yeah. So, I mean, it's just, um, you know, it's like kind of when I make that stuff, I'm, I'm thinking more about like, uh, you know, being a poet yeah. um, as opposed to like rapping and making songs. Like I, I make songs, songs like with courses and, structure and stuff but a lot of the like stuff that i make is like underground shit it's like two and a half minute verse three minute verse like i like it man. it's what i wrote it's what yeah. i wrote um and uh yeah and it's been cool i mean getting a lot of good feedback on it. it it's um you know i pressed it on vinyl and um yeah a lot of people picked it up so i'm really appreciative of that i don't like doing kickstarter and it's always like stressful pressing up vinyl yeah. on a credit card so definitely um but yeah i don't i mean yeah it's just uh it's just the sound i make man it's just the sound i make when i'm cornered i guess hey i like it though i think what I, what i was thinking about it when i was trying to like get a good kind of like phrase for it it feels like i said dystopian but you're not defeated i think a lot of people can get dystopian like the world's over welcome to capitalistic like death valley you're like the world might be over but i'm fighting back and i'm growing fucking mushrooms like get out my yeah, way and that's I what i like mushroom. about you like i like that you don't you don't go you're not going down without a fight and i think that's so important man like i love that I yeah love well that we're not gonna we're not gonna people aren't gonna go down without a fight i mean that's not the ever thing. it's like, it's not like ever. this um you know the united states is only a couple hundred years old human beings been around for hundred thousand like i think uh just because things are the way they are doesn't mean they can't be better. And if the system falls, we get to build something better in its place. And that's. Uh, I love that. I love, love that. Yeah. So, well, again, album is, I think it's tremendous. It's a uh, MBFX, uh, nothing left to say, walk with me, child or some songs that I would shout out to the listeners. Child had a very different like production style to it too. It almost like kind of fit the title of like child. It was almost more of like a youthful, like, I don't know, like, I don't want to say like uplifting because not to say like the album itself isn't, but I, I liked how different that, that production was in that one. Yeah. Again, it's just like, you know, I, you, you know, you just make what you make, you know, I don't have much control over what I make. I, yeah. You know, that's why I like working with other producers. I can say to pain one, Hey, I, I'm going for a sort of Jada kiss reggae hook kind of song. Like yeah. let's, you know like let's can you do that hey i want to make you know and it's like it's and it's like if i tell myself that i'm gonna make some shit that sounds like 70s prog rock uh, you know which is i don't have any control over it that's that's, yeah. that's that's what that's why we call in the adults there we go man well go with the album go hit up souls band camp to cop it directly and um before i ask you these final questions um is there any kind of like new things in the works you want to tease or just tell the people to stay tuned uh, um yeah i got a new album with pain one i'm not sure if it's going to be done before the summer or after but it's almost done i uh you know i might be uh selling plants so um Ooh. you know people, people want uh want some stuff for their garden hit me up i'll, I'll uh i should have a bunch of heirloom tomato seedlings and herbs and uh, a bunch of weird shit hazelnuts and chestnuts and so people people want some plants I'm, i might start uh slaying <laughs> slaying plant. i'm not sure if this is going to be the year i start slanging plants but it's either going to be this year or next year i'm, I'm I love it yeah. selling it's just it just you never know what 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 i'm going to have in this uh in the spring but i'm mm. you know hoping to sell some plants Tremendous. Well, stay tuned for plants and music from Soul. Um, I asked these kind of a couple of questions to everybody to conclude the interview. Um, first, how have you been staying sane throughout this pandemic? Is there anything that's been grounding you and kind of keeping you happy? What's that? Oh, is that cannabis? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. That oh, that's what's uh, that's what's kept me sane. Um, Got a couple I say it's yeah yeah that's i mean basically i've smoked more weed um this last year than 
my whole life maybe combined or something it's uh whoa it's been it's been i mean it's been kind of bad at points but um yeah i feel you uh, yeah i don't know man i just think like we just have to really you know really talk a lot you know my wife is working out of the house we have two we have a four three and a half three almost four year old and a one and a half year old and um and it's just uh you know just having good i don't know I don't know. I I already had the skills to do this because I've been working out of the house my whole life. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think having a yard to walk around in a big yard is like vital. Yeah. Um, but in general, I like everyone else, I've just been up and down. I've been pretty depressed multiple times this Same. last year. I've been like, like a lot of anxiety, like, you Same. know, it's one thing to like rap about the end of the world it's another thing to see it and for people to <laughs> feel it and for people to really understand that like this world like we're living through some world war ii shit and you know a lot of smart people are saying like imagine 2020 is the best year for a while you know and that's like all that shit is is intense to think about um and so i don't I'm just like we, me and my wife, just at the end of every day, we just like slap high five and we're like, fuck, <laughs> fuck, we, another one down the tube. I like that. Just get through yeah. the day, yo, one day at yeah. a time. Just eating food. And, I don't know, and, and you know, but it, but it's all you know. I was like saying, it's like so hard with kids, but it's like that's like one of the really fun things about being in, like all of us locked in the house is like we're getting so much um, together time, and we're gonna be so tight with our kids. Yeah. Um, and you know also doing the podcast work it's like yeah I mean, it's a pandemic but i can still like talk to anyone i admire from anywhere else in the world and yeah. uh have a good time like for instance like this conversation like uh thought about so many things that i haven't thought about for fucking years i love that honestly that's what i do what i do um you know brzezowski obviously um brzo was on here and he said the same thing and then he like and one of the Honestly, man, one of the things that gives me the most, uh, I think, like emotional gratitude about doing this is I often get like messages after, you know, these hour long, 90 minute, two hour long interviews would be like, hey, I kind of forgot like how much shit I've done. So just thank you for, you know, getting me back up to like today. And it was it just means a lot. And I'm like, holy shit. You like I'm just here as a fan, making sure that any bum ass motherfucker who's like main hip hop sucks. There's nothing out here. I'm like, shut up. I got a brand with a bunch of interviews before you say anything do your research jack so um <laughs> that's what we do what we do man I'm, I'm glad that you've recalled that today too yeah it was fun man yeah, yeah. you know if you know uh come on up dude well i'll host you anytime up here man i'll give you a tour of uh holland farms that means the world out. to me man like i can't even tell you that means a lot thank you yo um i got three more questions or three more right. um kind of like just easy shit though like where can people reach you if they have any inquiries or want to contact these nuts? Oh, uh, interview uh, over. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can hit me up. Soul, S-O-L-E at S-O-L-E-O-N-E dot org. Uh, mostly on Twitter. Um, you can tweet at me. You can pop me messages on Instagram. Don't send me messages on Facebook. I don't look at that shit. That fucking garbage. Bet. Um, cool. What was my next one? <laughs> I'm so on the moment. Oh yeah, anything you want to plug? I said go get the new album on Souls Bandcamp. It's MBFX. It's out now. But anything else you want to plug? You know, check out our podcast work. Check out Propaganda by the Seed with me and Aaron Parker from Edgeward Nursery. Check out the Institute for Post American Studies, formerly known as the Soulcast. And those are all on um, um, like wherever podcasts can be streamed. Those can be found. Yeah, bump up. Uh, bump bump my shit in your favorite corporate platform and uh yeah buy an album you know what i'm saying like motherfucking diapers ain't free you know what i'm saying true buy, that. A, mother, buy a motherfucking album these blueberry bushes don't don't plant themselves that tofu you know ain't free man it's tofu ain't to, especially that hey why tofu that five dollar main tofu you gotta watch out out here man they got those they got those hefty prices out here dude Maine's, <laughs> fuck. Maine's fucked from like financially like it, it reminds me of when i've like traveled to iceland and like you know you you see a 
you see a soda for like seventeen dollars. Yeah, something like Iceland that. has a huge inflation rate compared to America, right? Yeah. Maine, Maine has a huge inflation <laughs> rate compared to Massachusetts. Like, a, yeah, some somebody needs to do something about it because people pay way. It's way too, cost of living here is crazy. It's but fucked. That's 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 another, a different story. That's another story. We need more public fucking uh orchards transportation by the mm-hmm. way too i think we need that i need people got to get around easily it's like no one has cars out here and cost of living so low it's like you're fucked if you don't have anything and where's my jetpack you know what i mean i vote my flying I vote, car i voted for i voted for joe biden where's my jetpack? <laughs> i was promised a jetpack in every garage and food on yeah. every table and i don't have either bro i got yeah. food <laughs> all right so it's been a tremendous interview i think i could be tripping but i'm pretty sure you broke the record this has been the longest interview we had spose and mozart 212 and brzowski have all almost touched the two hour limit but you got the crown now just so we know well let's just leave it running while i go do some other shit <laughs> <laughs> i think uh we could do that or i could ask you the last question i got and we could wrap it up whatever you prefer all right, that, you're gonna ask one more question, then I'm gonna I'm about to piss myself. Again. Same, dude. I got because I'm old. So I'm an old. I'm, a, I'm an old man. You know. I've been holding man. it in for like 30 minutes. I feel like Walter over here from Big Lebowski. I'm gonna start fucking screaming. Yeah, um, I can't. I, I can't think when I have to pee. So. All right, we'll end it. Last question: Where will Soul be one year from now? Right here, doing the same shit. Tremendous new album out now. New podcast out now. Shout out to 207 Legend Soul for being here. Thank you, my friend. And that's it, yo. You have a tremendous day. Thanks for having me, brother. And uh, yeah, look forward to checking this out when it drops. Thanks thanks for for holding it down. Anytime, yo. See you around, Benny. I'll see you around. It was great officially meeting you, sir. For sure. All right. Peace out. Peace.